feel like it's like the board and former board that's here this evening. So we are going to uh, record this session though, and we have it live, and it'll be on our uh, upper right screen. We weren't sure the format and how many people are going to come this evening, so we opted to use the auditorium. Uh, two reasons: one, again, we weren't sure the size, and two, uh, we uh, it's much easier to see the the uh, slides, and there'll be a lot of graph or whatever. So we are going to try a different format this evening. We, we have done these community presentations in the past, and when we've done these community presentations, we focus primarily on academics. We spend the whole night digging real deep into uh, the data behind the academics. This year is a little bit unique, and we're going to spend some time on academics, but because of the PSSAs and COVID last year and making PSSAs, PSSAs optional, we didn't have we don't have good data to report from last year. So the data that we'll show you is actually from two years ago. Uh, but because of that, we thought we'd change the format a little bit. And so curious to hear some feedback after we're all done with this. But what we thought we'd do is focus on the big buckets that comprise uh, what makes our uh, the school district operate uh, and, and the financial decisions that we make, as well as the academic decisions we make. You <laughs> sitting here at the board, obviously, and then the community so they understand the impacts that, that are involved in this. Uh, likewise, of course, we have a couple of new board members, so I thought it would be for you guys, for you folks to hear and see the different uh, components that go, go into the, the district uh, makeup. So we're going to focus on a few core areas this evening. We're going to talk about the, uh, the mission, mission, vision, uh, and core values, the strategic planning process of the school district. Spend a few minutes on that, just give a high-level overview. Where are we going, and how do we get there? Uh, we're gonna talk, I'm going to spend some time talking about demographics and some of the changes that have happened in our demographic data. We'll talk about a graduation profile. Uh, and then we're going to shift gears. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Volker. Uh, he's going to uh, lead the student uh, achievement portion of it. He's the assistant superintendent that oversees that section of it. Uh, Dr. Reese then will take over and start talking about the student life section of it as a pupil services director. Uh, and then finally, uh, Ms. Del Guerco will take over the financial health of the school district as well as uh, wrap it up with facilities and a quick overview of what we've been doing with the projects uh, and the four phases of construction projects we've been doing in the school district. So that's the, that's the agenda for this evening. Again, the goal is to walk away this evening with a little bit of a broader understanding of what makes up the school district with some detail behind that. Uh, what we will do is after each section, we have some key takeaway slides, uh, and that'll be a chance to ask any specific questions about that section. Uh, instead of because it's so much information, we thought we'd just chunk it and then be able to ask questions after each section. Questions? Before I start. All right. Well, thanks again for coming out. I do appreciate it. Uh, there are a lot of slides in this, but we are going to try to move quickly through this. But that is not of any intent for us to blow through the slides, to kind of cover up anything or to not make it relevant. So if there are any questions, again, we'll pause that for each section. But yeah, we'll try to move through this uh, to, to keep the evening moving. Uh, so we do have a mission, vision, core values. That's the, uh, that's the information up there. Our mission is students first. Uh, we have went through a process where we redefined our mission, redefined our vision, redefined our core values. Uh, that process was our strategic planning process. And that falls under the umbrella of something called comprehensive plan which will be shown next. As part of our strategic planning process, we had uh, over 75 community members, board members, teachers, uh, students engaged in this process. And we went through a planning, a long-term planning, uh, long planning process where we put in goals for the school district. And as we went through those committees and pulled in all the different input uh, aspects of it, we created a Gantt chart. And out of that game chart has, is what has developed our goals over the last several years. So again, it fits under the model of what the state requires, which is called a comprehensive plan. But really, the goal was gather student input, decide where we're going, create this game chart, uh, five-year game chart, and then create our yearly uh, goals based off of that. And so our goals are this document. There are four separate unique goals. Um, again, we have our, our mission right here, student first. The first goal is all about communication. The second goal is all about instruction. The third goal is uh, safe and secure learning environment. And then the fourth one is uh, more of a financial one. It's the optimized organizational efficiency. These 
goal, these buckets have not changed over the course of, of the strategic planning process. What has changed is are the detail behind it. So some of these are multi-year goals, some of them are just targeted for a specific year. So there's these objectives that fall underneath each goal. Uh, and then within those objectives, we have essentially sub-objectives that we're focusing on. So if we take the first one here, uh, ensure effective consistent communication. Uh, the first bullet says continue to utilize quarterly digital newsletters, bullet points. So if you're not familiar, we have we for the past few years have not been putting out a printed newsletter. Uh, and so we as an administrative team, uh, primarily Mr. Volker that took the lead on this, as well as some of his team behind him, put together something called bullet points. All the administrators pull together and they put together a digital uh, newsletter. It is a one of those flippy books, so it's digital, but it feels like it's a actual hard copy paper, but it's all electronic. It's a very nice document. We try to highlight uh, specific programs each quarter. It's a quarterly newsletter. We, we try to highlight staff uh, and, and celebrate the, the successes of our students as well, which is really important. Uh, and then the second bullet here is implement new district website and smartphone app. So as you're probably aware, we have a new district website. We now have a smartphone app that, that goes right connected with the school district website. That got rolled out this summer. That was one of our key communication goals for this year. So that is just an example of under this umbrella goal of communication, the objective is consistent communication. And then the two pieces are the newsletter and the, uh, the website overhaul. Again, that flows through this whole process, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But that's the format of our goal process. And each year, we revise this. We'll give a mid-year report, typically January and February. We'll talk about again at the end of the year, we'll talk about all the accomplishments or things that we need to continue to work on for the following year. And then come the summer, we'll, we'll revisit this and come up with a new set. In terms of uh, demographics, before I shift there, any questions about the district goals? Strategic planning process. So Mrs. Uh, Eisenhardt is the uh, district uh, school board liaison with that. She worked directly with me. Uh, and we have some really good dialogue as we go through all the different components and talk about the things that we've been done well, some of the things we need to work on. Uh, and, and that happens again throughout the course of the year. So shifting here's a little bit demographics. <clears throat> this slide up here illustrates what is happening with our district enrollment. So about a little more than 10 years ago, we were at around 2,000 students. We're now down to almost uh, just, just under 1,300 students. So we, we've had a pretty significant decline. We could spend a whole night talking about what that uh, makeup reason is. Uh, an aging population, transient, more, uh, more rental units, carbon transiency, uh, which is causing poverty. We'll talk about poverty in a second. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different factors. There's not a lot of developments that have happened. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening, but the reality is, is that our enrollment continues to decline. We we kind of bottomed out and we're holding steady here, uh, and then we took a look. We took a pretty big hit here uh, over the last two years and lost almost 100 students. Uh, and so we're closely monitoring that and continue to really evaluate that district enrollment trend. Um, the other change that's happening is, is this aspect of it, our, our economically disadvantaged. So <clears throat> that we measure by the amount of students that are free reduced lunch. That continues to be a pretty big concern. So back here, um, uh, this era, I was uh, Mr. Volker at that time, and we had about 18% poverty. Now we're at 31.5%. So that, that number has been pretty steady the last five years, and I'll be the next slide. <clears throat> we'll spend more time on special education in a second. Um, but that is definitely a concern for one of our, when we talk about equity as one of our goals for the school district, one of the pieces that we primarily look at because we want to make sure those students that are, are not as well off have the same capabilities and the same opportunities when it comes to their learning. Uh, the GIP aspect of it is 0.7%. And this is another one that most recently has been on the rise. We have 14 students that are ESL students. This is, uh, you, you might have heard ELL, English Learner Language, ESL, English Second Language, Limited English Proficiency. There's all kinds of terms thrown to this, but essentially, this is our highest number that I know of that we've had with uh, 14 students that are currently ESL students. 
So this is our student population trend. Uh, so again, when we look at this, we are only studying the last five years. This is uh, a dip. The reason that this is a dip this year, I do not believe it's because our families are more well off. I believe it's because uh, lunches are free this year. And so this is how we measure poverty is by the free and reduced lunch application. So students didn't have to apply. The parents didn't have to apply for free lunch or reduced lunch. And so as a result, that number is, I believe, artificially low. Uh, when we started this school year, we had uh, two grade levels at the elementary, one the elementary, one the Indian school, that were almost 50% poverty. So that is definitely a concern. Uh, some of the things we've done as a community, uh, as a school district, we have a backpack program where food goes home with uh, students on the weekend to be able to help uh, supplement that. As a community, we've been able to, put, to partner together and I think all of us know we've really tried to become a community partner school. Uh, and the, being the school district and, and the way this rural community is, the school really becomes a hub of the community. So we partnered with an organization called Helping Harvest, which was the uh, Greater Burks Food Bank previously, new name Helping Harvest. Uh, and during COVID, they developed a mobile food bank out in our area. And so right here in the middle school on a monthly basis, there are a line of cars that go all the way out to Dollar General and up the back street uh, coming to get food uh, on a monthly basis. And it is a great partnership we've had with them. They were going to discontinue it, but they have decided to continue that all the way through next year as well. Yes? So I'm assuming that the property level is based on household income. Can you tell me what those numbers are? Uh, it is a based off household income. Um, off the top of my head, a family for I believe it's fifty-six thousand. But I can we can double check that real quick and give you a number in a second. But it's somewhere right around that for a family of four. <clears throat> yes. Do you think that number actually is? I know you're just two from the head. But what this, this one here? Yeah. This year, I I would say it's it's going to be around that 34, 35 percent. So. Mr. Wagman was is part of the uh, Friends of Green Wine organization. That organization has raised a lot of money uh, and contributes it back to the school district. Our nurses are the ones that then go out and on a at each holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, uh, go out and buy meals for families, uh, whether it's a Thanksgiving and turkey and a whole, as well as gift cards, uh, $150, $200 gift cards that go to the families to support them. There's also a food bank in town uh, that, that is supported both of families in need as well. So I was going to ask um, that trend that we've been experiencing in terms of economically disadvantaged populations growing. Um, could you comment on how it's our trend line compared to the county? Um, and just a comment from um, the experience over at the PCIU, which runs a homelessness program. The homelessness numbers are dramatically increasing. The IV runs the program for five counties, so um, South Eastern Pennsylvania regions, including Burke, of course, but across those five counties, the homelessness numbers are skyrocketing. I wasn't sure if you could comment on county wide economic disadvantage. So, the, the, I don't have the exact statistic to make a statistical comparison, but on a trend line, I would say that as a county, we're seeing an escalation of poverty as you mentioned the homelessness growing um, for us that has we've seen an increase as well dr rito hate to put you on the spot do you know what the number is for homelessness right now for our students yeah the number actually went down the last couple of weeks so we were down to maybe down 12. we were as high as was it 21. yeah we, we were at 21 like two months ago yeah i think it was about two months ago which is significantly higher than our norm which is probably closer to that uh, 8 to 12 number. So homelessness, we the definition of homelessness is also doubling up. So if a family is uh, evicted out of uh, their house or for some reason loses their house or their rental uh, and they move in with a friend, move in with a grandparent, move in with a parent, uh, that is considered homelessness because they don't have their residence anymore and they're living with someone else. So when, you, when we talk 21 or 12 as it is now, uh, that would be inclusive of, of those so district enrollment declining 2000 we're down to 1300 uh that that increase in poverty is 
is absolutely one of our, our target areas, as well as that growing uh, ESL population uh, and, and that transient student family place that's happening with it. Any questions on this? We kind of had some dialogue and questions beyond what we've had. <laughs> Go ahead. So every year, the families that have historically applied for free release lunch, uh, there is a requirement that by the start of the following year, they have a, there's a buffer window, I believe it's 30 days, to to reapply. We do a lot of communication, uh, phone calls, actually mail letters, emails, uh, to reach out to the families to help them reapply. We also will actually help them reapply uh, if they don't have the technology resources to be able to do so. Uh, but there's a lot of support to be able to remind them to do it and then also support them. Uh, any new families? I was, yeah, I was just going to say same thing. When we register a new child, same thing. There's, you know, here's here's the information. And then in the summer, we also push that out a bit. Max blast to all the families saying, here's an opportunity. Nicole, did you find that number by chance of what that was for families for? Okay. Sorry, I looked at you earlier. I thought that was a. And I uh, nod that we were on the same page. And I think we can really go straight to the strike for our staff that in addition to all the things we've been doing proactively, uh, they have so many conversations with our kids and they ask the right questions and they hear the right things and they're able to hook students up with resources. If they hear a concern outside of the windows for registering for free and reduced, we're able to you know, put a lot of our families in touch with supports. Uh, a lot of it, again, is due to our, our great staff and conversations. Yeah. Um, so the students who are on the state funded the Medicaid plan, are they automatically put into this or do they have to apply separately? They are. They're automatically. So that there is a statewide. Yep, exactly. There's a statewide um, umbrella program right. uh, that just, once they have. Once, once they're put into that insurance fund. Yeah, it automatically yeah, kicks in. Account. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. This is you knew the question earlier. Okay. Yeah. So with the fact that there's very little room for expansion inside the district, mm -hmm. what is the threshold number in where we start to investigate other measures as far as realigning or compensating for the drop in enrollment? Whatever that may look like, right? Internally, you have a number set that says if we hit 1,200, we're going to enact Plan B. Yeah. So when, when we start looking at numbers like this, um, we have to start really seriously looking at our general <laughs> class size uh, because we've been maintaining uh, pretty steady class sizes in terms of our teachers. We haven't had a pretty significant uh, changeover of, of that. I think it's 15. School year was the last time we had a pretty significant look, uh, re look at it. And we, we have to be careful because we're also in a, in a position where we want to make sure that we have appropriate class size levels and we're maintaining appropriate education. So we don't want to just go like, oh, let's, let's go up to 45 kids in class. That's not obviously appropriate. But uh, you know, 20 students in the class is, is appropriate. And so we need to start looking at that. Um, and so I don't necessarily have a target number, like, okay, 2,000 it is, uh, because a lot of the strategies that we would say, okay, here's the number, we can close an ancillary building. Those pretty drastic measures have already been taken by two boards uh, and have put us in a pretty good financial position because of that. So really now it becomes a position of uh, the, the staffing component of what resources, whether that's support staff resources like higher professionals, uh, or it's uh, professional staff to be able to uh, properly align ourselves to support the, the needs of the population. Yeah, I guess that population one was where do you real, at what point do you start realigning classroom teachers into, uh, as we know, we know the special education component of this is increasing, so at what point do you start to make that transition where they, you, know, you no longer have that classroom 
class size might be a little bit larger, but your special education component grows with the size of your. And that's kind of what we're doing now with the uh, the uh, ESSER, the COVID money. Mm -hmm. It's we're we're making that shift by having the intervention specialists come in. Uh, we're using the long term sub plan for that, but there might be a natural progressional shift that the paid contractual staff start to move those into those roles and we start to make some transitions that way in the next two to two to three years. So uh, switching your uh, graduate profile. So this is uh, this is a snapshot of our graduation rate. So there's two ways we look at and measure graduation rates internally, uh, as well as what the state looks at. So our graduation rate is uh, mid to low 90s. And so the way we, we evaluate this is the actual graduation cohort of four, four years. And then we also look at it as a five-year cohort. And the reason we look at a five-year cohort is some students need that extra year. And our goal is to get students to graduate. Do we want to graduate in four years? Yes. but the goal is to get kids to graduate. And so this, that's why we look at both a four year and a five year cohort. Uh, and so we're, we're hanging, you know, right around that, that mid to, to lower 90s, uh, a little bit more specific here. Um, you can see here that we're at 91.84%. That four year cohort actually uh, increased this past year. The five year uh, was, was not finalized by the, uh, uh, but officially at the state level, so that's why it's uh, not not that part of there until January. But you can see that our um, our five year cohort, besides this one dip that happened, uh, and then we all kind of year that happened there, we hang around that mid to high 96, 97. This was kind of an anomaly uh, for, for our graduation. So, what happens when our kids graduate? This is a snapshot of what our students are doing. So, when you, when you look at it in a gross bucket uh, list, we have about 65% of our students that go on to some kind of post-secondary education, whether it's a four-year degree program or a two-year degree program. Uh, that's pretty significant. Um, we have about 25% on average that go right into the workforce. Uh, and then we have, this year we actually had a pretty sharp increase, 6% that went, or six students, that went into the military. Uh, typically, we always have, this, this was a low year, we usually have about three to four students. Uh, this last year was a pretty, pretty big spike. Uh, so what we have been trying to do here as a school district since uh, for the last 10 years is my mantra has been, we want to make sure students are prepared for whatever life challenge, whatever life steps are going to be next, whether they're going into the military, whether they're going into the workforce, or whether they're going into post-secondary education. And for me, that is the goal. So I want to make sure that if a student walks out and they're going to work at to the work right away, whatever that job is going to be, they have the skills necessary. Uh, if they're going to the military, that they have the ability to be prepared, have a solid education behind them so that so they can get through the military. If they're going to go to college, that they're prepared for those classes, so that they're prepared for uh, whatever that sec post secondary university class structure might look like, uh, academically as well as structurally. And so, I think we've accomplished that in several ways. One, we have the virtual academy, so we give students those opportunities to do online learning. Uh, and, and that's obviously when you go into a four-year, two or four-year degree, that's a big component of, of college. Uh, we've instituted uh, this past year a uh, program, and Tom, I think you might speak to this in a second, but we've instituted uh, two mandatory classes for our students. One is a uh, freshman seminar, so when they come into the high school, they have study skills. Uh, and they're, they're, they're man, man, mandated to take the class so that as the transition happens from eighth and ninth grade and they become more independent learners, they have the uh, background to be able to have the study skills and have those uh, key components to help them be successful through their high school year. And then conversely, at the tail end of it, we also have a class that's mandatory now that is more focused on financial literacy, focused on uh, resume building, job preparation, interview skills, so again, workforce, military, college, there have some experiences. Uh, we have a phenomenal pro, uh, course that uh, is run by Mr. Kissler in the business office that is focused just on that. Uh, we've taken pieces of that and used that as our foundational element 
to be able to build this class of all seniors or all students have to take before they graduate. So a lot of things we put in place to accomplish that goal to make sure our students are prepared when they walk out of, out of the high school here. Where are our students going? <clears throat> so the data we have, 17% uh, good town, 5% 5, 5 Penn State faculty, uh, other 15, and then there's like this unknown uh, component of it. Uh, admittedly, we want, to, we want to get a little better uh, at tracking this, but this is uh, the data we have at this point uh, for where our students are going on a college university uh, level. The other component we have here, especially when we start thinking of alternate pathways of education and alternate pathways of uh, career choices, is uh, BCTC. We have a strong partnership with our BCTC. The BCTC First Career Technology Center is one of the highest in terms of vocational centers within the state. They they hop, they score the when, when you look at their score rating, they use something called a Nazi exam. They are at the highest or almost at the highest uh, compared to all the others in the state. Uh, these are the core areas that you can go into within the BCTC. Uh, and this is the component, this is where our students go. So primarily transportation and construction, followed by the services and healthcare industry is where our students are entering when they go into BCTC. And then they use this as a springboard to go into uh, either sometimes directly into the workforce, other times into those two-year programs. There's a strong partnership with BCTC and, and Iraq uh, that there's a dual enrollment component, and so they can have uh, above 18 credits uh, within the time they graduate, and then a reciprocal agreement that they can go to RAC for the next year as soon as they graduate to finish out their, their degree. So a lot of strong opportunities for our students, as well as some really professional opportunities on the healthcare side that we're partnering students up to be able to go into uh, hospitals and get really pre-med experiences before they go into uh, a medical field with it, if that's where they're uh, desired. Here's our uh, participation in terms of county. So we are uh, about uh, just over 27, in this case 22%. Uh, and when you look at the uh, the percentages compared to others, we're, we are definitely one of the top sending districts in terms of the percentages. Fleetwood, uh, Kutztown, Football Hawkins always very strong uh, as, as well when, when you look at uh, the sending school district. So interesting, just a side note, there are two vocational schools within Berks County. The BCTC services the 16 school districts up here. Reading and Antietam are in a separate GoTech. So there's, those students do not come to the BCTC. They have a Red, Red Muhlenberg uh, Technology Center that they go to. This is Yeah. That's all participation. I mean, everybody's participation. This, this is all right here. Yeah, yeah. That's everybody's participation. That East and West combined. Is, big, room, is there room for more? For more students? Yes. How much? Um, overall, the BCTC has a little bit of a decline right now, so there's definitely room for growth. So they're constantly looking at their program and reevaluating the program to fit what the need is for the season. So I sit on the BCTC board one of the advice superintendents, and that's one of the reports we look at in the case. How many students are enrolled in each program? What's the historical trend? And do we need to start looking at different programs or reallocate resources to programs that are over capacity to make sure kids have opportunities? So to answer your specific question, how much room for growth? I don't know if I can give you a number, but there's there's definitely room for growth. Some programs are a little bit more taxed, others there's a lot of capacity. But again, we're constantly one of the restricting factors to expansion. Teachers? I would say teachers as well as um, actual facilities. So for instance, welding jobs was one that was restricted. Uh, they did put a whole new welding program in welding shop one uh, this past year. And that that really helped us to work in one. But that was the one that was how I was thought of after because of course put that, but that is just a lot of career opportunities and high gaining dollars to go along with that. Now we can open that up and it, it has not been restricted. Another restriction has been that professional health care course, but they have restructured that a little bit. And now there's an A instead of just one course of running, there's now an A and a So that doubles capacity and uh, there's three more opportunities.
So graduation rate is 90 plus, uh, two thirds of our students seeking some kind of further education, uh, and then 25% of them directly going uh, right into that workforce. And again, the goal here is we are ensuring that our students are college career ready, uh, that whenever they leave Brandy Wine, that they feel like they can look back and say, I had a good education at Brandy Wine and I'm prepared. That's my goal. So next, I'm going to, any other questions before I move forward? Yeah. Sure. Again, comment on the um, college university attendance slide or the curricular? Yeah. Can you go quietly? Um, I love that we can identify our students going on a good time on the 10th day and last on the right team. But we can't identify or name any other colleges, whether they're state schools or private um, universities. It just, to me, that doesn't make sense. If you're asking the question and the answer is Kutztown, or if you're asking the question and the answer is in a school, Mansfield, right. why are we not capturing Mansfield? So, I can just speak to the, the other section we do have information for. So everything that's in the other section, there's like one student that's attending one school. So we're able to identify all of that. The purpose of this graph and chart was primarily to show that we have a lot of students that go to Kutztown. We have a lot of students that go to Rathenel Tri-C. And we have several students that go to Penn State. Um, what we really want to do better with, though, is that unknown side. So I just want to clarify that. The other, the green section up there, we have those schools. The unknown, we do not. That's where we do things. Yeah, so to your point, we want to have a little bit clearer data, uh, and that's definitely one of our goals moving forward. Yeah, and um, I've always been curious. You, you are clear that primarily choose first one and 10 state, but what they're being um, selected for. Are we giving them a diverse enough menu of choices, or is it based on their parents went there, or their friends in the community go there, and that's where they go? You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's probably so, a mix of both, and it's yeah. probably locale as well. Uh, yeah. That that helps feed that, and we are lucky to have those two institutions right here in our backyard. Yeah, yeah. And we have several other very high quality. Non yeah, a Veronia Albright. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are, they, are they also being guided or given the information that sometimes it's better to look at the private schools because they will be cheaper than the state schools? So th that is my uh, that's my understanding of talking with a lot of our students that have been graduating and saying that they're getting a, they're getting a some really good private schools than yeah, I mean, there's we have some success stories of students this past year that are going to school free to colleges like Juniata because they have full rides uh, based off of not necessarily all academics, student involvement, student engagement, uh, being involved they in community have, activities. Yeah. They have great liberties with their money, and they have great piles of money. <laughs> A lot more than the state universities can right. can dish out. Financial. Correct. Yeah. But it's a know, very good point. You need to, you know, you know, some people say, oh, I have to go to the state school because that's all I can afford. I tell them, look at the private schools. It's going to cost you, it might cost you a lot less than the state school. Yeah, apply and make sure that you're, you have this opportunity. Apply where you want to, and then look at the data after you get the offer. Yeah, keep all the cards on the table so you can make that educated decision. Yeah. So we're going to shift gears, and uh, Mr. Walker is going to talk about the student achievement side of it. Uh, so, Mr. Walker, there Thank you go, you sir. Very much. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Uh, for those of you that are tuning in, I, I think everybody here knows, but uh, my name is Mr. Volker. I'm the assistant to superintendent here at Franklin Heights Area School District. Uh, it's going to be my pleasure to reveal and share once again some of the academic data that we have. Um, for those of you that attended 2019, uh, academic data presentation, you're going to see a lot of the same information. Unfortunately, uh, for the PSSAs, that's really the last standardized assessment data that we have to share with you. Last year, uh, PSSAs were more optional. As such, we had 20 students across the district take PSSAs. That sample size is too small, 
make any meaningful conclusions with. So I'm leaving that data out and I will share with you what it is that we have. So once again, what we're taking a look at here, PSSA results for English language arts. So you're reading, um, uh, you're reading in English. So here we have 17, 18, 19. This is our year progression. And you can see, relatively speaking, for the districts, so that would be grades three through eight, uh, we're holding relatively even. Uh, in conversations with several uh, community members and board members, there was a question, how do we stack up against the, the rest of the county? So this progression chart here shows from third grade, third grade through eighth grade. You can see how our, our students perform relative to the other school districts within the county. So by the time our students leave eighth grade and go to the high school in English language arts, we're performing very well among the top of the county. When it comes to math assessments with PSSAs, what we see is again, similar numbers, relatively flat, uh, holding steady. And when we take a look at that county comparison, you can see that we start very high and then there is a dip in here and we go back up. So across the state, the math uh, trend line is definitely a regression down about like this. So what we do not wanna see is this sharp a decline. This is what uh, gives us areas of concern and areas that I'm going to go into later about what we've addressed with math and what we're continuing to address with math. But you can see once again, by the time students leave us here in eighth grade, that we're performing in the middle of the pack in terms of uh, uh, comparisons to other school districts within the county. When it comes to science, science you're gonna see more volatility with the assessment results because instead of being assessed in grades three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and having all that data, students are just assessed in grades four and eight. So it's a smaller sample size. It's a little bit more of an apples to oranges comparison. So you will see a little bit more volatility. What you can see here though, is an overall trend line of improvement. Um, and for the 2019 academic data, we're very proud to say that when students leave us here in eighth grade, we're the top performing school district in the county. We're going to shift gears and we're going to leave elementary, intermediate, and middle school, and we're going to shift to the high school. So once again, the data is still not finalized in terms of some of the tools that we use, which is why you see this goes to 2019. It does not include our 2021 data. So the data here is the same data that I presented uh, during the 2019 academic data presentation and then also at the community town hall meeting that we held last year. So what we can see and I can tell you is 2019 was actually a, a very tough year for us uh, in terms of the Keystone exam. So uh, 2021 was actually an opportunity for a little bit of redemption for the school district. And even during the pandemic, uh, again, same order, I'm starting with uh, literature, which is the ELA side of the house. During the pandemic, we actually ended up going up, uh, we went up 15 and a half percent. So meaning the number of students that scored in the proficient and advanced categories increased significantly. So we finished at 57.4, which if we were to draw another line here, would be right in around here, one of our highest performing years yet. So that is very positive and very encouraging. The work that has been going on, even during the pandemic, is starting to yield some of those positive results. Math, as we've said, I think every single meeting, whenever we talk about academic data, is an area of concern. So before I get there one more time, I am not able to give you county comparisons for Keystone data. This is where we stack in 2019. Uh, the 2021 countywide data has not been released yet. Again, in 2019, we dipped down here. I anticipate we'll be back up closer with the pack um, this next, whatever this countywide data is released once again. Math was and still is an area of concern at the high school. Before the high school gets a target on their back, I think I need to explain that 
the math issue that we have at the high school is actually a very complex one. And I'm going to dive pretty deep into that in one second, but let me go over the data with you first. So again, I mentioned 2019 was a tough year for us, uh, but overall, if you could ignore that, you would see a general trend line moving in a positive direction. But unfortunately, we can't just ignore data sets. It's not the way that it works. Uh, I can tell you that in the 2021 Keystone uh, exam year, we did drop significantly. And again, that, not that much, but dropping during a pandemic is to be expected. I was hoping that we would not drop as much as we did there, uh, but those are the numbers that we have. Again, I do not have countywide comparison data for you at this point in time. Um, as soon as I do, I will, I will share that information out. But inevitably, whenever we see that there's an issue, well, what are we going to do about that? What's being done? What has been done? What are we doing? What are we seeing results with? What needs to change? So I wanted to just take a couple of seconds and explain what it is that as a school district we have done over the course of the past four approximately years to really address this issue. And it is probably the most important part of our strategic plan. So just running through this, when we first identified we had a real issue, um, the first thing that we did is we took a look at the curriculum. We made sure every single thing within our curriculum is aligned to the proper standards uh, without going into too much depth there. Then we did a full assessment review. What we're testing our kids to make sure that they know and understand is that aligned back to the curriculum. The questions that we're asking on the, on the assessments, is it, is it a basic yes or no question or is it requiring higher levels of, of thinking? Um, then we took took a look at the pacing review. Are we getting through all the curriculum that we need to get through? We found out that we weren't. Some of the curriculum we weren't getting to by the time of the Keystone exam. So we adjusted some of our pacing. We partnered with the BCIU and had a multi-year support from their top math guru. He was out in our classrooms through multiple years doing walkthroughs, providing feedback, meeting with teachers, providing uh, professional development. The board was extremely supportive when we said, we have a real problem. We need more manpower than, than we currently have available to address this issue. The board was extremely supportive and uh, created a supervisor of instruction and assessment position. We tested it out first as a, uh, an ad hoc, uh, not a full-time position. That uh, position has been yielding, um, I, I, I don't even know how to quantify that, um, insurmountable data to give us direction and make sure that the teachers are better supported. Um, so that was uh, turned into a, a contracted long-term position. Uh, we reviewed instructional best practices. What do we do from the second the students walk in the door to the time that they leave? We visited other school districts to find out what are you having success with, whether it's growth data or just achievement data. We met with everybody that was uh, yielding positive results. Because of some of those meetings, we implemented a hybrid instructional model um, for all Keystone uh, exam trigger courses, they're referred to as. We updated our curricular resources. We purchased different tools that the teachers can use in the class, both the core uh, curriculum as well as the supplemental materials that we use. We have ongoing professional development. Uh, the supervisor of instruction and assessment is constantly in those classes, partnered with our building level administrators. Um, and then we finally started adding some math intervention positions to provide support for the students that need the support. I drew a line here because that's all the stuff that we've already done. These next three bullets are the things that we're currently and actively working on right now. Uh, the first is making sure that we're utilizing our interventionists the best we possibly can. So as a school district, we've never had more interventionists than we've had before. We need to shift a little bit what it is that we're doing because we have this additional manpower to make sure that we're using those interve inve interventionists to the best of our ability. Then, uh, we need to make sure that we have those supports in place for those students that are, in fact, struggling. So there is oftentimes conversation about 
does this student get identified for special education or do they just need additional supports? So if you're um, familiar with the terms RTII, MTSS, making sure that there is a, a system of support that's in place for students that need that extra support before they just end up uh, getting tested for special education, which might not always be the best thing for that student. So making sure that those systems are in place, uh, that's a big part of what we're working on now. And then big picture, we're taking a look at, okay, at the high school, that's one of the shortest instructional days uh, in the county. What could we possibly do to eke out some more instructional minutes at the high school? Maybe we can do something, maybe we can't. Again, that's currently uh, something that we are evaluating. Before I go into bio, are there specific questions about math? Because again, when we take a look holistically at the school district, math is one of those biggest areas of concern. Yes? Across the district? Including KU interns. I think I'm at eight. No, 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 no. That's all intervention. That's K through K through twelve. Um, for math, we have a unfilled position at the high school, and we have a position at the middle school, and we have some support in math at the elementary. Not, we still are a little short staffed on our intervention roles at the elementary to be able to provide the math side of the house. Yes. So honestly, it would really come down to the specific student. We're at the point where we're getting very granular. So if that student plays sports, that would change when that student would be available. So it's it's really a tailored instruction. Uh, and if they have time, they're at BCTC and they're gone half the day. If they have study hall built into their schedule and someone's available to work with them, could they be partnered up with National Honor Society student? Um, a lot of that comes down to what does that student have as far as a need and what do they have in terms of availability? Right, so. It's, right, so this is actually making sure that we have a schedule for those supports. That's one of the biggest things that we're taking a look at right now, because currently it's not like at the um, element, well, intermediate middle school where there's like a wind period right. built in. There's no wind period at the high school the way that it's uh, currently set up. Good question. Mr. Hepburn. Could you go back to your math results? Yes. The one with the dot line, whatever. Oh, for PSAs? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's three third grade and eighth grade coming in right about 40, 41, right? Yeah. Uh, could you go to the science? You know, with the other side. We're way up there. Yes. I always heard, in my mind, math and science are together. What, what's happening here between the fourth grade and eighth grade compared to the three and eight fourth grade? Math. So, there's a lot. Um, when you talk about similar, yeah, similar, you know, types of. Uh, thought processes work, right? So you typically think about your ELA as your more creative side and your math and science is more your concrete, right? So the way that it's set up here, math assessment anchors and science assessment anchors, they're totally different. So while you might be using like similar, uh, I don't know, thoughts of the side of your brain, uh, it's it's completely different set of standards. So there's not as much of a correlation as you might think that there is. 
I'm not getting ahead of myself. I didn't see what's going to be happening with the higher grade level. I'm hoping that they do pull the study once they get into your algebra, or geometry, and all those things there. Uh, the mathematics with physics, chemistry, and things like that. Am I going to see that? So, the way that Keystone exams work is you have a literature Keystone exam, which is typically taken in 10th grade. You have an Algebra 1 Keystone exam, which is taken whenever you take Algebra 1 which could be in middle school, it could be in high school, whenever you take that. And then you have a biology keystone exam, and that's usually taken in 10th grade as well. Um, as far as algebra two, geometry, physics, those are not keystone exam assessments. Okay. Mr. Wagner? How are we identifying those students who are struggling prior to taking the keystone? If they are just towing the line, so they're they're as far as their day-to-day uh, -day grades go, they're passing. They're not struggling. But it comes to Keystone, some children aren't test takers, and so not necessarily teaching to the test. But how do we know, identify that they would potentially struggle with that Keystone? Right. So we have a number of assessments that we do utilize to identify those students that are struggling. So CDTs are typically uh, used in that area, as well as Imagine Math. Imagine Math is one of those resources uh, that we've implemented uh, right here where I'm talking about uh, update curricular resources. We've implemented that because it gives us some very good data points to use. And it gets very granular because in, in the world of math, I mean, you have everything from geometric concepts to algebraic concepts, and, and they're very different. So uh, that helps us drill down and identify what the specific skills are that students are struggling with. And then that's where we're wrapping around the support. But admittedly, I'd like to strengthen that process. And that's really what these two bullets are about. And Imagine Math is being used in high school as well? Imagine Math is being used K-12. Yeah, great question. Yes, Mrs. Hume. Back and the math results. The yes, it says? Yeah. Um, there's a different slide I was looking for. Um, that one? Yeah, I thought I saw something that indicated that a very low percentage of our students in math are um, exams. Uh, this would show it. Uh, so in 2019, uh, 17% of our students were in the advanced section. Yes, yeah, yeah, so. you, you could be thinking of the, 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 the one that was. That guy. Yeah, the one that had the bottom. Yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I thought I saw 1%. Yeah. So, so yeah. we still have the one, the most recent data. Yes. Um, obviously, the numbers are, are disappointing. Yes. To me, it, it's very interesting and frankly alarming that from an advanced perspective, we essentially have no kids that are surpassing. So that. admittedly, usually the students that end up scoring the advanced range for our Algebra 1 Keystone exam are students that are taking it in the middle school. Admittedly, our middle school math numbers were significantly down during the pandemic. So a lot of those students that were scoring in the advanced range were now in the proficient range. And that has been historically. Historically, again, based on the assessment, and again, I struggle sometimes how deep to go during these types of conversations. But what I am starting to see is a return to pre-COVID numbers. And again, I remain reserved and but optimistic uh, that I do anticipate those numbers to go back up. Um, in a year or two, I anticipate to be back at our traditional um, advanced percentages. But historically, the advanced numbers on that were middle school students scoring higher and have not been high schoolers scoring advanced. Correct. So if you think about the, the math progression, the way that it's set up, you take the Algebra 1 Keystone exam when you take Algebra 1. So students that are more comfortable with math, are, let's say, better at math. It comes to them easier. They're going to be taking that Keystone exam um, in middle school. 
because they're ready for it. And those are your more advanced math students. What we really need to do as a district is make sure that we are providing the support needed for those students that are not on track to take the Keystone exam in middle school to provide additional supports to close that achievement gap. So when they get to the high school, um, that gap is near close, so they stand a much better chance of passing the Keystone exam. It is not my expectation, based on all the data that I'm taking a look at, uh, that students, when they're taking it at the high school, are going to start now triggering lots of advanced results. But what I want to see is I want to see students on a better projection for proficiency when they take the exam at the high school. And when I talk about math being complex, it's not that the high school math teachers are just so poor, they can't teach math. It's not that. Yeah, there are some instructional practices that we do need to tighten, but there's also additional supports that we need to put in place along the way. And Mr. Farina has done a nice job uh, shifting some of the things that we have done within this past year to provide that level of support. And seeing Mr. Farina standing up in the back, I know he wants to say something. <laughs> Uh, and I think also too, it's worth pointing out that over the last five years, we've more than doubled the number of students who are taking algebra at the middle level. Uh, so when I became principal, we had about, when students would leave here, out of an eighth grade class of about 25, or out of an eighth grade class of about 100, 25 students would have taken algebra by the time they went to the high school. So you, at that point in time, see more students scoring at the high school level because more students were testing at the high school level. Uh, recently, we're seeing about 50, 60 eighth grade students out of the class of 100 completing Algebra 1 prior to heading to the high school. So when you look at the students who are taking Algebra 1 at the high school level, traditionally it's our students who are more, uh, who are struggling in math and our students who are at that grade level math uh, level. What that's also done for our class size is that being that we have more students in the higher levels, we've been able to schedule those grade level classes with much smaller numbers. So in our current eighth grade, we're running three sections of pre-algebra. All three of those sections have under 15 students. So that provides that, uh, out that pre-algebra teacher for the chance to work small group. Uh, in one situation, it provides for a co-teacher for a special education students. Uh, so by pushing more students through that algebra uh, gate uh, at the middle school, it's providing our students with more higher level math at an earlier age, while also providing smaller class sizes for our students who do need that more support. Thank you. Yes. Um, observation about the performance during the pandemic. Yes. So we're saying, I still think of this as a pandemic year, but you're you're talking when you say pandemic year is last year's data. So I refer to that because. One of the hardest things throughout the pandemic has been that shifting between instructional models. We've been very fortunate to be able to provide in-person instruction throughout this entire year. Is it perfect? No. Are kids quarantined? Yeah. Is, is that a challenge? Absolutely. But the biggest challenge that we've seen is when students are not in school. So that's, that's why when we talk at the board level, I say, you know, our goal has to be making sure that kids can keep coming into school because the data clearly shows that our students perform academically better when they're here with us. And some of those gaps and deficits that we've seen throughout last year, um, yes, yeah, still in the pandemic, but um, we are starting to see those numbers rebound as we're taking a look at the different, you know, supplemental assessments that we have in place to really find out where those deficits are. So with that in mind, the performance on the um, English and language arts um, during the pandemic, aka when kids were being schooled from home, yes, versus our kids' performance on math um, during the pandemic, than aka when schooled from home. Clear difference. Clear. The transferability, if you will, of those teaching. Yes. Uh, skills or learning opportunities seem to not be negatively impacted on the King's DLA side, but clearly impacted on that side. On the science side, what? So I, I can say again, when we look at the 20,000 the foot view, yes, 
But when we get down to really what does that look like, I, again, I don't want to, th this is critically important, which is why I want to spend the time doing this, but just diving it one, one step deeper, what we noticed was typically you have your students that struggle and you have your students in the middle and you have your students that are um, doing great, right? What we noticed is that group in the middle got significantly smaller. And the students that were doing great before generally still did pretty well. I mean, yeah, were there maybe a few less? Yeah, but what we saw is that the students in the middle that group almost went away. So we ended up with students that definitely regressed that were struggling before. And some of those students in the middle went down that way. That middle group didn't really exist as much as we used to see. So that would be one of those warning signs of, that, that we saw. So. And was that um, the case across subject areas? Or did you notice a specific trend that was more than that? No, that trend I saw across subject areas. Yes. Yeah. I think too that the very the, the real challenge when you look at algebra is the students who took the algebra keystone last year that in 1920 they were enrolled in pre algebra. So in March 2020, when the world shut down, those students in effect lost the entire fourth quarter of pre algebra. We're taught pre algebra through asynchronous learning back in the way beginning of the pandemic which meant they came back in in 2021 and enrolled as Algebra 1 students, where we tried to front load a lot of what they may not have had the most uh, structure in Algebra or pre-Algebra into Algebra 1, and then condense all of Algebra 1 into a shorter window, all while going through hybrid instruction, full virtual instruction, back to hybrid, back to full in person. So again, not from an excuse standpoint, but from the, you know, I think literature and biology pick up a little differently. But algebra one builds specifically on algebra or on pre-algebra. And those students lost in the quarter. I shouldn't say lost, but those students had a great impact of that pre-algebra uh, experience. Thank you for sharing that. That was the conclusion I was I was wondering yes. if it made sense to make. You just synthesized that for me. Thank you. Cool. Absolutely. Okay. So I'd like to shift into science because science is way more fun to talk about. <laughs> All right, so the thing that was very impressive uh, to me is both ELA and biology went up significantly uh, last year. So overall, we had a 56.3% uh, proficient or advanced rating, which again, we don't have any county comparisons, uh, but we were in the middle of the pack. I anticipate that will bump us right back up to where we typically are. Uh, in the science world, we typically are, are in the top quarter of the county. So again, I expect those numbers to come back up whenever that data is released. So oftentimes we talk about, well, maybe the, the students just aren't taking the Keystone exam seriously. So we take a look at other data sets. And we can see, uh, I'm going to look at 21 and 22. These are the, the uh, grad cohorts. So students that graduated in 21, students graduating or graduated in 21, students that are graduating in 22. It's those cohorts. So what we can see is in ELA, this is how our students did. This is the state average. So in ELA, we outperformed the state average. In math, we did not. In ELA, we outperformed the state average. In math, we did not. Again, that's a similar trend that is not surprising to see when we take a look at PSATs then. Same thing. In English, we outperformed the state average. In math, we did not. So when we talk about systemically, organizationally, do we have issues? Yes, there is a, a million fantastic stories. And sometimes I get a little upset because it's just due to the nature. I focus on the one negative a lot. Um, but that's because that's where we have to improve. And that's where we have to allocate a lot of our time and resources. So again, we're going to continue to do that. I reviewed with you the number of steps that we have taken, what we're currently working on. Um, and then just for the uh, benefit of kind of going over some of this data, because I know there were some questions about AP and dual enrollment. I wanted to kind of run through some of these numbers and explain where we are. So as a school district, we have 22 total courses that are AP level courses. 13 courses are offered in person. Of those 13 courses that are offered in person, nine of them are also dual enrollment eligible. Uh, and then additionally, we have 14 courses that we can offer through the virtual academy. 
Um, in 2019, we had 31 students take 39 exams. In 2020, we had 24 students take 29 exams. And then in 2021, we had 31 students take 48 exams. This line here talks about the percent of students that scored three or higher in passing basically the AP exams. So last year we had 54% of the exams taken, PETS meaning scoring the three or above. There are some questions about why would someone take an AP course? Why would someone take a dual enrollment course? The whole purpose is about earning college credit. So you can earn college credit either way, by passing the AP exam or um, passing your class that you pay dual enrollment for. So dual enrollment, we have different partnerships with uh, colleges and universities. Uh, the primary one is through RAP, but we also have partnerships with Kutztown. And now we have a partnership with Albright. And again, if these courses are offered as dual enrollment, there's a fee that's associated with it. And then as long as the student passes the class, they earn that credit. And the nice thing is through a partnership with RAC, um, that credit is transferable to the state schools. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, this is just some interesting data as well. So in the 1920 school year, uh, 140 students actually took dual enrollment uh, classes in 2021, 116 in 21, 22. 154, we're seeing an increase in the number of students that are actually earning college credits. We have a student at the high school right now that I think it's like about two and a half years of college credit done. It's, it's incredible what students are able to do by the time they leave us for very affordable pricing. So again, that kind of goes back to the slides that Mr. Potter was talking about, making sure that we set our students up for success when they leave us. No matter what they want to do, uh, if they want to go into a two-year, four-year college, they can get a great head start here at Brightwine Heights. Questions on AP and dual enrollment? Yes. On the um, AP slide, I feel like there's um, a piece missing. So we're talking about a small piece of the pie here. What is the size of the pie? In other words, it strikes me that so few of our AP students actually sit for the exam so we are seeing few students sit for the exam and when we started interviewing students and saying you know why is that the, the response really mr jenich usually got was well i could take the test or i could pay for the dual enrollment and i just have to pass the class either way i'm getting that college credit and then mr jenich his response is usually okay makes sense <laughs> You know, and, and that's what we're hearing from our guidance counselors time and time again. So I don't know, Mr. Jinch, not to put you on the spot, but if there's anything else there, I know, Mr. Pottinger, you've had conversations as well. Is there anything? Well, I, I would just agree. I mean, in, in any conversation, dual enrollment has, has skyrocketed, and you see a lot of high schools going one of two directions. They either want to add their AP scores, so they'll limit their dual enrollment courses, which means their, their students don't have the access to that, that college credit in their dual enrollment classes, but then have to take the AP to get that college credit. Uh, to get college credit under the AP, you have to score three or higher uh, on that national level exam, where for dual enrollment, again, you just have to get above, you know, that 70%, about that 60% to pass the class. Um, and then uh, what we found too, is we have a lot more lot more students than um, still sit for another test. And at this point, you have to sit for three keystones. Some of the AP students that if they want to sit down, there just seems, and I'm sure the pandemic also had a, a piece to do with this. There was just a bit of a, they were getting a little worn out with a lot of the testing. So the option was to either do one roll the class um, or sit for the AP exam. It's been much harder. Uh, a lot of times we're having those conversations. I've been in the classes where our AP teachers are saying that to sit for the exam because of the importance of taking a national level exam. But again, you know, short of forcing the students into it, it, it just becomes personal preference. Uh, so even to go into the SAT too, we're seeing a lot more test optionality uh, in certain colleges where those previous tests you had to sit for ACT, SATs, um, they're not being, you know, they're not being requested anymore, so students don't have that, there, there's not as much of an appetite then to sit for them. And, and just to add an additional layer on that, if you remember back to that slide we talked about with the data for where students are going to school, they're going to state university. So 
and there's a reciprocal agreement. So if they take dual enrollment, it automatically transfers as that credit, not even as an elective, but as that credit. Uh, so there's that layer onto it with an additional layer that this year, your dual enrollment class is free. You don't even have to pay for it this year because of the grant through RAC that all the dual enrollment classes are free for students. So I anticipate this is going to drastically drop off stay, for this year. competitive this year, RAC allows everyone to take one free uh, dual enrollment class. So we have a lot of students that who are paid with, who I sign up to take an AP test, but I can't guarantee that I'll pass or take this free dual enrollment class um, through RAC. Because again, they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to draw people to their institution as well. So uh, I've seen, you know, there was, we, again, we, we pushed the importance of taking the test this year to our students, but there was a point, especially in the fall, as kids were kind of signing up for the AP test, where we did see a pretty significant drop off in who would be sitting for the AP test, but a pretty drastic increase in who would want to take a dual enrollment class. Again, for me, I fall in line where as long as my students are getting credit for college, uh, how they get that credit, um, it, it makes me happy to see that that opportunity is available for them. So I don't. I don't necessarily try to drive them in one direction or the other as long as they have the opportunity. My understanding, though, was that you sit for your AP exam in April or May ish of, of your spring semester. You select dual enrollment in, in you know, the prior year and you start dual enrollment in the fall. So to me, one doesn't preclude the other. It doesn't. It doesn't. But why would you risk? Why would you risk paying for an AP exam and trying to take a test, put yourself through a test, when all I have to do is pay the money, take the course, and then get the credit? If you're committed to a state school that will receive correct. the dual enrollment from RAC, mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense. Yep. It depends but on that student's pay. If you're interested in a broader school of colleges and universities, Dr. Carter's point, private school, right. Right. then it's going to accept the last credit, and yeah. it could, could improve your merit scholarship money, because you're going to get for the AP exam well. Which is why we're, we're extremely happy uh, to be able to provide both. Uh, but that, that is the feedback that we're hearing from, from our students. And now there still are, uh, I mean, just being transparent, there are school districts that require students take at least one AP course uh, before they graduate. Um, again, that's not the philosophical approach that we have taken because it might not behoove a student to do that through our lens. Um, but you will see that, uh, again, I think this got brought to light when the US News and World Report came out. So a school district that does not require every student to take an, an AP exam will not benefit as much from their calculations and we won't look as well off in those types of reports. But again, what we hold our heads high about is the fact that we have all these opportunities for our students. And being a smaller school district, we feel as though we're able to meet with students individually and plot out their paths. And if it's best to go down that AP path, we have those offerings. If it's best to go down a dual enrollment path, we have those offerings for students then as well. And if they're not sure, we certainly encourage them to do both because they can. Yes. So our AP classes, they have their weighted, correct? Correct. Part of framework. So I guess my my only concern with all of this is I'm not saying we have to force every kid to take an AP class. I, I, I don't agree with that at all. But if these kids are signing up for that AP course, mm -hmm. I think as a district, it should be our requirement for that course that they sit for that class. So like I, like I have here, Nine of our 13 um, AP courses that are in person are both. Right, and I think I'm sure they're doing dual enrollment as well. Right. Because they are getting the weighted AP course on their report card for grand line. As a district, that is our requirement that they take that AP test. You'd like to make it that, or are you asking yeah. if it is? No, yeah, that's just my two questions. Okay, because we also weigh uh, dual enrollment courses. The ones that aren't included. Right. There's Correct. Some courses that are not included. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is that, and I, I do not agree with 
the way school districts are judged by these world reports and everything else, I, I think there's so much more um, that we should be worried about in education sure. than those reports are coming out. But we get so many more points the more kids we have to take the United States exam. Sure. And, and, and I'm sorry, we need to play the game. Like, and like, it's not tagging those scores, but you know, yeah. we got to get ourselves back on the map, and that's one small shift in this game of cards that we're playing to really help us get those numbers back up. I honestly do believe that the work that we're doing behind the scenes for the Keystone exams, I feel like that's really where we need to focus our efforts. I do believe once our math goes back up to an acceptable level, um, we're going to be right back with competitive numbers across the county. It's really that that area that's holding us back. When you take a look at those calculations, yeah, the AP exams could help us. The thing that's the thorn in the side is the math. It's, it's the keystone exam results. That's the biggest thorn in the side. AP is a nice little feather in the cap. And as you know, these AP yep. kids are bright, bright kids. Yep. So the chances of us having them pass and giving us those points that we need are pretty high. So it's like, they're like a really good, again, card to have in our back pocket because they are the cream of our crop. And it, it, it'll be a quick jump in those scores because the process that we have for Keystone, this is going to take time. Sure. And years. And, you know, a lot of different things that aren't going to happen overnight. Whereas we already know we've got these bright kids. That's what we got to do. Just pass the AP or to get the AP aided grade from grade one, you have to get those up. So if you would think that logic holds, the data shows that less than half the kids who take an AP exam pass it. And these are the bright kids. They're good test takers. They're bright, they've been taking the math courses their whole um, school career. And yet when they sit, when they choose to sit for an AP exam, they don't perform well. Mm -hmm. Why is that? To me, I would look at the four courses that are not school enrollment and see how many of those kids in those four courses that aren't school enrollment are sitting for the exam. Mm -hmm. And if they're not sitting for it, why is it? Is it because they know they won't perform well? Is, is it because, for example, quite a few years ago, we, we as a district made a decision to say the school's not going to pay for your AP exams anymore. It's on families. Have we unknowingly um, diminished the pool of people taking AP exams because those families don't want to write checks for every AP, AP class they're students? If I had just moved this one with Mr. Dennis, they have no reason to. There's no motivation behind it. Why would they want to take their math class? Because they're going to get the credit anyway. But that's why I say look at the four courses that don't give them credit. Okay. Um, right. So for school so enrollment. Why are they choosing not to sit for the exam? And when they do sit for the exam, why don't they perform well? Right. There's, I think there's something there. How much did it make you sense? How much is it? I think it's $90. Maybe it's maybe nine right and, and we do pay for half of it when needed. Each test. Each test. Each test. Yeah. So. We're taking 48 tests. That is, is that 31 all? students taking 48 tests. Okay. Yep. They're not being taken 48. Correct. Right. Yep. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if you choose to take an exam in their path of study, so if their major is going to be, you know, politics. Yeah. Then maybe they want to take the AP exam sure. in U.S. history and U.S. stuff. Yeah. Um, and they're not going to take the one in literature because that's not their interest. Um, so there may be those kinds of choices being made. But I, I, I would challenge the notion that this is a pandemic-related um, um, observation. I think. Dr. Carter and I both have experience long before that, and, and it's consistent. Yeah, no, I, I don't no. think this is pandemic related. Okay. No. No. Yeah, I want to make sure I looked over. Yeah. Did I no. say that?
the student population, and I, I'm still trying to understand what's really going on. No, in terms of mode of instruction, the test became much more difficult to take last year because they had to be scheduled at a specific time worldwide. So you were either sitting at noon or four, so the, the, the different things that we had to adhere to as a result of virtual instruction, lockout browser, the pandemic, didn't make the testing any less rigid or easily accessible for the students. So it made an already challenging and important process more challenging and harder, which is tends to be the college board motto, but that's my two cents. So when I designed the presentation, I designed this as a community presentation. Coincidentally, it's primarily uh, presented to board members or for, former uh, board members. So you are aware of these things, but I'm just going to run through this and the fact that through the, the curriculum instruction lens, the things that we've been working on within the classroom over the last several years, we have listed here. So again, we've really focused on making sure that we have pre-K counts in the elementary, interventionist positions. We uh, shifted what we're doing with, we had a technology class here that we shifted more into technology coaching. We've implemented a STEM pathway, maker spaces in the learning commons or libraries. We implemented a high school computer science pathway. We've implemented a ton of transitions and mentorships across our buildings, uh, elementary all the way to high school. We've implemented, as Mr. Potter was talking about earlier, two required courses when we said, what do we want our students to know when they leave us? We implemented these two courses. We have internships available. We shifted what we were doing with our eighth grade world language. Instead of a year of Latin, we now have an exploratory program with a quarter of a genius hour type course called Inspire. We shifted our graduation requirements. We did class rank. We did. We took a look at all the courses that we were waiting, uh, and, and we shifted that around to make sure it was standardized. We have more partnerships than we've had before with higher ed. We've implemented hybrid and personalized learning. We've set instructional expectations. We've personalized and added uh, time for more professional development. We've standardized a walkthrough procedure, overhauled our evaluation model, uh, and then we've also just strengthened the induction process and we'll be continuing to do that uh, in, in the coming years as well. So just from that snapshot, like what has been going on over the last uh, several years, there has been a lot that we have been working on with a focus on math instruction. I think I hit it. <laughs> kid, kid eight. We're doing pretty well. 9 through 12, literature and bio is very promising. Math continues to be an area of focus. We have many supports in place for math. Unfortunately, that's not a quick quick fix. That's going to take some time. Uh, and being a super patient person, that's hard. Um, uh, then, of course, uh, the college credits. We were talking about AP dual enrollment. We see more and more students leaving us with more college credits. So if that's the path that they choose, they're set up for success. Questions, comments, concerns before I hand it off to Dr. Reese. Uh, just on the college credits, it, yes. uh, it comes down to where you're going to school. Correct. Because if you're going to an elite school, even a five on an AP test is not going to get you past. Correct. Yeah, a lot right. of it comes down to that. Or if, you're, if it's a class in your major, they're not going to give you credit. They may give you an elective, but they're not going to give you, if you're going into math or engineering, they're not going to give you a calculus credit. Correct. Uh, yep, and each college is different too. Yeah, but the more elite you get, forget it. Correct. Correct. Okay. It helps you get in, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Chapter is uh, just the board is out. Okay. 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 Special education. Chief Breath, are you ready for this? Good. Okay, so the numbers that are being shown here right now is the special education enrollment for the last six years. And this data comes from the child count we do every year. So every year, um, IDEA, the Individual Disability Education Act, requires us to do a data enrollment. We, up, we upgrade all our students into a system. They send it to the state. It's done statewide and it's done nationally. And we need to share all the numbers up to December 1st. So when you're looking at the trend, you look at 2019, 2020, our numbers really jumped right there. And when we look back to see why the numbers were jumping a little bit more during that year, um, the enrollment in the district is going down as we're moving a little bit through each year. But that year we had a lot of enrollments from other school districts. We actually had 25 enrollments from another school district. 
The other thing we're looking at that impacts our special education numbers are early intervention students that come to us in kindergarten. So early intervention is the services they receive for developmental delays or learning disabilities from birth through age five. So the students who are identified are receiving services from the Berks County IU. It could be in their home, it could be in the Head Start, it could be in the daycares, it could be in any place that, that student is during that time. When they come to us, they bring their IEP that they have. It's actually called an IFSP, an Individual um, Family Service Plan. Because the IU, when they're getting their special education services from birth through five, they actually work with the parents as well, giving the parents training in their homes and helping them support their children. When they come to us, then we'll either evaluate them again and we'll look and see what sort of program that they need. So when we looked at 2019-20, we also had 15 students coming to us from early intervention into kindergarten. So we're talking 40 extra students that we are already giving services to that we have not identified. When we identify a student, it's usually a parent request or the school district request after they've gone through all their interventions or the NTSS RTI process. We look and see if they have a disability and if, they have, if that disability adversely affects their educational performance. So many students may come and not have a disability, but it's not drastically impacting their educational performance, so that they would not be identified. So right now you see that our numbers, we have the 21-22 December 1st count. It is actually a 291. So the district enrollment's going down a little bit, but I believe that the interventionists are really providing some supports in the classrooms. So we're seeing not as many requests and not as many students that are being found eligible for special education. Dr. Reese. That, that, that number is slightly deceiving in that the percentage of the student body is higher 21-22 than it would be in 2016-2017. Even though the number of students is the same, the percentage of the student body is significantly higher than 21-22, correct? Right, because we have 12 more students as far as December 1st, but that's 91 counts. I'm not sure what we had in 2016-17, I have to go back there. Dr. Reese. I have it written down in my notes over there. Yes, it's right here. I have. Okay. Uh, 16, 17, we were at 1463. We're going to address percentages in a second. Oh, it comes to that. Yep. The company gone. I'm sorry. You I'm did. really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm engaged. You are. Yes. And pulling information from previous slides. Well done. <laughs> uh, I pass and everything. So the next slide is we broke that down. When we're looking at the 21, we're looking at 216-17 all the way through 21-22, we want to break it down into categories. As we have a continuum of services in the district, there are 14 reporting categories in Chapter 14. These are the reporting categories that we have more of an enrollment. We work with autism, students with autism, emotional disturbance, which is those that have some significant behaviors or they're having problems dealing with um, other students with their health and welfare, sometimes it's some mental health needs that they need. Intellectual disability, which they have changed a few years ago, and that used to be the medical retardation in case you weren't sure what intellectual disability was. Other health impairment, that is those um, disabilities that impact you because of a health situation. Sorry, I get a little nervous when I'm in front of you guys for some reason. <laughs> So other health impairment are where all the other disabilities sort of don't fit in there. So if someone has ADHD, sometimes it's asthma, it may be Tourette syndrome or ADD, those usually fall under the health of other health impairment. Specific learning disability is those reading disabilities, math disability, or written expression. And then speech or language, of course, are the speech sounds and the language needs that the students may have. So looking at the different colors throughout the years, as the years go on, you see the significance of what the needs are in the district. So right now we have learning support classrooms, autistic support classrooms, life skills support classrooms, and emotional support classrooms based on what we see what the needs are the last few years. We're getting to your slide. <laughs> okay, going back, still, still a child time, working through the years. The blue is the brown and white height, the red is the state. In comparison, our numbers are significantly higher than used to be at this point. Again, I'm going back to 
the slide that you're looking for. Although our average is our average is significantly higher, you can see with the chart up here, specific learning disability is growing. So we're getting close, but we're not up above the state average yet. Other health impairments is the disability category that we're finding has drastically increased. They use all these numbers from child fund when we have our compliance monitoring every five years. Then they look to see if we have um, a need in one of those areas that we're over-identifying. Right now, I don't think we are over-identifying, however, this here is that it is when you look at the chart. Again, when we have students that move in, they're coming to us with an IEP, and they already have the disability category in that IEP when they're, when they're coming to the grand one. Any questions on that? Are these numbers including often the facilities, including the outplace students that go to other schools, or just in-house students? LK students as well. Okay, so total students that are school district responsible. Yeah. When you do your child count, it goes for compliance monitoring. The child count is, they're looking at the monitoring of your programs and activities. So then when we do the special education, uh, we do the special education plan, we use this information. We see what action plan we can put in place to help reduce some of those numbers. And again, a lot of the things Mr. Boker was talking about with the interventionists, the different scheduling, we're working towards helping with that as well. Then when they come to the monitoring, they'll review all those files as well. So the key takeaways, identification of students is higher than the state average, as we have seen there. And then student movement is contributing factors to the identification rate. Again, when those movements come in, we're already up to 10 this year, as of December 1st, and we have a whole year, a whole half a year to go yet. So I anticipate that we're maybe up to 20 or more at that point. So any questions on any of the takeaways? Okay, so let's move on to student life. Sorry, I was moving on really quick. Okay, so student life, what we're looking at now, we're moving away from achievement a little bit, we're moving away from special education. We want to encourage our students to get involved in more extracurricular activities and activities, or extracurricular activities such as athletics and clubs, music and band. So we'll start with music. We're looking at the intermediate unit and the intermediate and middle school chorus, intermediate and middle school band, and we're looking at the high school chorus and the high school band. You can see that the numbers are going, they're decreasing as the years go. We're looking at our intermediate and middle school chorus. Numbers are a little larger than the high school. However, the numbers are also decreasing with the dark blue and the top one. When they move to the high school, the chorus and the band, they have so many more opportunities. We're seeing that the numbers are going down because of all the different classes they can choose, different clubs and other different activities they can jump into. We do want to note that for the intermediate middle school chorus, the band and the jazz band, they have received outstanding and superior awards in the festivals that they've been involved in in the past few years. The high school chorus and the high school band, as you know, the band just was in the Philadelphia Marching Parade for Thanksgiving. And in the high school course and band, they've received, they've had students who are participating in the district and state chorus or band each year. There's usually a representative. So they are doing well overall, even though we see some of those numbers increasing. Dr. Reese, do you happen to have any benchmarks? Um, so, for example, high school band, 10% of our kids participate. To me, that feels high. That feels good, even though it's a um, just over the last couple of years. But, you know, in other high school grounds, is, is it 10% or is it 20%? And it looks like 20, maybe 15 and 20% participation or, or are our numbers actually together? Well, I think our numbers are really good. We're just seeing some of them decreasing right now. We have really good, uh, we really have really good engagement and participation in our activities and our athletics. I think that's a really good message. I mean, that ours, I mean, we have a low population, so that's why the percentage is higher. If you go to the bigger school districts, a lot of your course and bands are addition only, and they restrict how many people they have, and it's not open to anybody who wants to buy out. Exactly. Because of the amount of students they have to pull from. One of our major issues, especially with band, is marching band. Mm -hmm. Because then you have students that are in fall sports, mm -hmm. and with only 100 kids per class, right. you have kids that can't do that. And so right. that's why we have a lot of drop off that happens in band, which yeah. you know, Dr. Burr. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to share that they are doing so well to 
get the out outstanding and superior ratings for their festivals when they do participate. And then having district and um, county representatives, you know, have a very good deal almost every year. Dr. Reese, one, one question, and, and I'm jumping ahead to a slide because I know we're cheaper here. However, <laughs> the, the one question I have is that the, the trend is the one that concerns me, and I'm just looking at historical data here, is that that percentage, while 10% seems good, it's significantly less than it has been in years past. And then even worse, historically, and then when you jump down to high school sport participation, the number of multi-sport athletes is significantly less than I would assume it has been historically. And I guess my question is, what is that trend? Because we've always been a small district. We've always had the same number of sports offerings and, and uh, band and chorus opportunities. What are we attributing those numbers being so small in comparison to year past? The music, one of the things Mr. Potter talks about, the marching band, that's one of the things that the students picking at extra classes, they need, we're not picking it, they need to take that. That, because they have so many other things that they'd be involved in, they're not able to do that. So that helps reduce those numbers. Mr. Dinich, if you have anything else that you want to share about the marching band or the, or the marching band in the high school, that was pretty much what they shared with me because of the taking that marching band class that kind of limited the participation with that. I think, I think what I've noticed is in, in my three years too is we, or I'm seeing more of the, the same students doing absolutely everything too. So what ends up happening is we're almost stealing from our own pool, being a small school where I know my first year I might have a uh, course dedicated students, right? And then, then dedicated students to some athletes. I'm seeing more and more that it's the same students across the board. So what ends up happening is we're, Although we try to be flexible with every student, there are times when they just have to make a choice academically versus one of those, I would say, you know, more encore related subjects, uh, especially when they run into my DCPC students because they're only with me for five periods a day. And if uh, two of those periods are eaten up by, we'll say, music classes, again, we can be flexible and I'll work with any student, but sometimes the fact of the matter is they're just not scheduling into it. Uh, I don't know if that's more interest based. I found, especially, again, never want to use the pandemic as an excuse that the imbalance of my students right now that have jobs is more, is more than anything I've seen in my three years. So in any conversation with a student, if, if I need something to talk about, I'll ask them where they're working. And, and I bet you nearly 100% of the time, if it's not something that's under the table, these are students that are actually out there now thinking about whether or not they'd like to play a sport in this winter season or keep their job. And those are very real conversations we have because for some of them, you know, that, that money could be, could be a car, you know, it could be help. But I've had a lot of conversations even just this past year with, well, I wanted to go out for wrestling or I wanted to be in the band, but right now I'm working six days a week uh, after school because they have, you know, a lot of places have the hours and they're giving them to their students. But before, it was probably tougher to get scheduled into certain shifts. I just I just get concerned, you said, knowing that we've been roughly the same size district for a long time, that we just don't have good cooperation between activities. And that's the one thing that I get concerned about, that, you know, say sports and music and across the different sports, because so many people are specializing, that our, our coaching staff and, and our music staff are working well together to make it possible for students to be multiple uh, sport athletes and also band and chorus working with those departments. That's why, just like I said, I just wanted to make that comment because I get concerned that seeing those numbers pay off like that, that we are not working like, cohesively. I think, I think one of my big pushes is about that flexibility because it would really bother me to see your point too if that were something that we were struggling with. So I really, above all else, try to make sure between activities, between sports and between music, that if there's an opportunity for us to do something, that we're making sure that we've exhausted every opportunity for that to occur before we go ahead and start limiting things. So that, that, that's probably one of my, my biggest priorities. Perfect, thank you. I, and I'd like to piggyback on that too as well, because I honestly, I will say this, and I, I think there is more collaboration now than now with 
these outside groups, the band, chorus, athletics, then when I got here. I mean, there's a lot of looking at the schedules, making sure. I mean, um, I know in the spring is a busy time, too, that we actually look at our athletics and we made changes to our athletic schedule to accommodate that when they have band and chorus concerts that they don't um, conflict with each other. And it is a, you know, it is a balancing act. It's like Matt said, we're seeing a lot more kids that are athletes, but they're also in the band and chorus, too. So you're, you're trying to find that balance. And, in athletics, the same thing uh, that, that Matt indicated with the work, I see that also having an impact on athletics because there are athletes that haven't gone out for sports this year that have in the past, and I know I have reached out to them and said, oh, you're not going to play basketball this year? They're like, no, I have to work at the next month. So um, the other thing is there is more specialization in sports now. Uh, we do have more athletes that are saying, I'm just going to do this one sport. That's all, you know, that's all I'm going to do. Uh, and that purpose is winter again because, you know, we have track athletes and we also have winter track and we have our winter sports. We did have some athletes this year that said, you know what, I want to concentrate on track. I like track. I'm going to go out to uh, Pittsburgh and do winter track. I'm not going to go out to basketball this year. And, and Scott, I know we've talked about this and I think maybe you've seen it in the community, but it seems like at the younger levels, there's there's a drop off of parent involvement as well as student involvement in the youth soccer, the youth programs, which is having a reciprocal effect as we as they matriculate into middle school. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we did see. I mean, the pandemic you know, really hurt our youth uh, sports, um, and uh, you know we are seeing a little bit of rebound this year, which is a good thing. Uh, so hopefully uh, um, we'll see increased participation on our youth programs. But yes, you know, over the last few years we have seen a, a decline in, in participation in our youth. Programs. And the and then so the one other thing with when you're talking about the chorus and the band, they're all the same period. You have two choruses and you two bands. So those students will have to pick. Okay, you want to do jazz band or concert band. Watching tons of band, we're going to do one of the choruses, and you have to split between them. So, the ones that may want to do all four can't. Has that always been the case? Um, I think that's true. When Jackson sure, took ninth grade, they split right, right, the jazz band and split. Oh, jazz band, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was after. Yeah. 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 I thought you meant like that. Yeah. And because then it's in the morning when they're one of the another big engagement opportunities is our high school club participation. We currently have twenty percent of the high school students participating in thirteen different clubs. The clubs meet weekly, monthly, or biweekly. As you can see, there's a list of the clubs that are in place right now. And again, we really encourage, as you heard off of talking today, engaging and working with the whole child so that they can use that which is the further career in whether it's the work first, the military, or um, secondary education. They have the commitment, being involved in all these activities in athletics. They have the leadership skills, and it's really looked at their resumes when they move on. Yes, Friends Forever Club, we kind of started talking about it last year, and we started this year. It's working with the, um, the students in the life skills programs. So we have the students in regular education or in special education that are working with those students and they're helping cook, they're helping doing some tutoring, they're going on field trips, and a whole, um, the activities of community service, when they're doing backpacks and things, they have people who are volunteering. It's grown, it's up to about 17, 18 students now, so it's doing really great. It's a great for them working with each other, and it's also going to help with the bocce ball as far as um, participation with all the students.
There's a bunch of others. Tutor, you know, all sorts of things. So anything we could do to put together a program where we're matching up to keep those kids on our campus for employment as opposed to sending them off in a car on a highway to somebody else's employer. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. We had, I think the number is 14 students that worked for us last summer. Uh, and, and that was the highest we've ever had. It was great. Yeah, yeah we started that a few years back. The school year would be um, potential as well. Figure it out. Yeah. And I know private clubs, many of the students are in more than one club as well as some of the students are in more than one um, athletic event. In the community outreach, the district really prides itself in reaching um, out to the community and involving them in the school. It's really great for us because we can show off the good things that we're all doing and we're working on every day, but it also helps us with the supports for and resources for our families that are in need. So here are some of the things that we're doing uh, as of now. We have quarterly parent workshops that People Services is doing and it's pretty much sharing resources that can help the parents out in the community, letting them know what is available for them and who to reach out to. We've done social emotional learning, trauma-informed care. We did just resources where we showed, we went through the website, we had community and schools come, we had concern and um, parents or counseling, just to give the parents some information on things that they had not known before. So we do that every quarterly. We just finished the second vaccination clinic downstairs today. Uh, it went very, very well. We, we had 40 students arrive for their second shot. There weren't as many choirs this time. It was really <laughs> nice. They also had, you know, some cookies and candy canes when they were leaving. We have the annual vaccination, vaccination clinic, the annual dental program, we work with helping harvest, helping the families receive some food, quarterly clergy meeting. Again, that's a great resource to share whatever kind of supports that we can bring in or that we can help them with. Um, state police partnership, friends of Brandywine, communities and schools, which is we have two we have two social workers that come to the middle school. We partner with Quicktown and Fleetwood um, for the communities and schools that we have received a grant for a year or two ago. And it's a great resource for our students with mental health needs. And he also goes out, they both also go out into the community to work with families. We have the annual angel tree, which Paternal Order of Eagles helps us, the Quicktown Optimus Club. Again, holiday meals for family needs from the Friends of Brandywine. We have gift cards that we share from the Community Outreach Club gift cards that the high school and middle school student council help with, and then of course all the parent organizations that we're involved in. Again, we pride our community outreach. We want to engage and build those relationships. It's good for our students, it's good for our staff, and it's great for our district. So key takeaways and questions. We have an emphasis on community school partnerships, very important, and high student engagement and participation in school activities. Any questions? Good evening, everyone. All right, so I'm kind of going to go over through the budget and adoption timeline, um, kind of note the Act 1 index, um, kind of how that modifies um, our budget process. Uh, then we'll kind of touch on, you know, the revenues and expenditures that go into a budget, um, and also kind of touch on fund balance and some funded and unfunded mandates um, that we have to um, deal with while creating the budget. Um, so like all, all state, like all school districts in the state of Pennsylvania, we operate in a fiscal year from July, starting in July and ending in June. Um, as required by law, we're required to adopt the final budget by June 30th. Uh, this requires a lot of planning and even some estimation. Because um, if you don't know, we, are, we operate on the same um, fiscal year as the state, so a lot of, we have a lot of unknowns going into the final budget. And we, we typically focus on the general fund. Um, I touched about earlier in previous presentations with the board, um, and we'll see it throughout the budget process that there are multiple funds, but the budget primarily focuses on the general fund, which is the main operating budget um, 
for the district. And the final budget is the outline we use to create the financial growth path that helps us support and carry out all the functions that Tom had talked about, Andrew had talked about, and Renee had talked about this evening. And then you'll typically hear that the state government and local school districts are seen as you know, partners in funding school education. Um, but as you can see by this high graph, um, it's not exactly a 50-50 partnership that you would think. Um, Pennsylvania, as you may or may not know, ranks 44th in the country in um, state share of funding from public schools, um, which means that we, we get, um, we're kind of underfunded compared to most states um, from what we get from the state. Uh, only about 31% of our public education cost, um, or 31% of our revenue comes from the states versus you'll see the local revenue makes up about 68.1%. Um, at least for anyone with the task of making up the difference. Uh, from a financial standpoint, this is mostly through property taxes, um, which we all pay. Um, so this lack of state investment is troubling and burdensome as it shifts the burden to the local tax level. And then you'll see there, there's some examples of different local, state, and federal um, revenues. Um, typically, this is a typical year, um, what we had budgeted before you know, COVID and all the extra funding. Typically, we received less than 1% of federal funding. Um, I would say last year, I think we got about almost 4% in federal funds um, as far as actual not budgeted, uh, which is all the ESSER and COVID funding. Uh, so, so what is Act 1? Um, you'll hear that this evening and a lot going forward. Um, aside from the fact that it kind of gave us a longer timeline um, and more kind of deadlines throughout the budgeting process previously mentioned, um, it's also known as the Taxpayer Relief Act as it imposes some additional and very critical limitations on school districts. Um, Act 1, it basically limits our power to raise real estate taxes. Um, Therefore, and I'll show you slides down the road, um, school districts must keep tax increases within the Act 1 index unless they file for exception. Um, I think that the last time we had filed for an exception was probably about 10 years ago, um, and it's typically for special ed or teachers um, increases. Um, as a result, absent increases in state funding, um, school boards were often forced to develop what's called resource-driven budgets, meaning we can't really just create our budget and say, what revenues do we need to meet it? We have to um, make some cuts that we would not like to do. And then here, I don't know if you can see it, but it's also on the handout. Um, this is our Act 1 history. So you'll kind of see pre-index and then index. Um, let's say prior to the index, you can see that we had you know, an 11% tax increase, a 7% tax increase. And that was where you really, you kind of developed your budget on the expenditure side and then you increase taxes, you know, without limitation uh, to kind of meet your needs. And then you kind of see tax increase compared to the Act 1 index. So here you'll see the most recent history of our Act 1 index versus the actual increase. Uh, the blue line is the adjusted Act 1 index, the amount that we're allowed to raise taxes. Uh, without exceptions. And then in the red line, you'll kind of see our actual increase uh, starting in 2012 2013. Um, so, what you can't see on this chart is there's kind of, for anyone kind of went on a roller coaster ride, there was ebbs and flows. You know, we, we saw that 11%, 7%. Um, they would have those years of 7 and 11%, and then they would go down to 1%. Um, from a district standpoint, and also, you know, from a taxpayer, where that your tax dollars come out of your pocket and the money that you make. Uh, that's, that's kind of hard to prepare for. Um, so since then, um, and also in large part in the change to administration, uh, Andrew had come on in 2013-2014 as superintendent, um, you'll kind of see that we have kind of a steady, moderate increase. Um, so it's more, you know, his mindset was to kind of maintain a conservative approach with moderate increases, uh, which allows us as a district to have financial stability um, with that little bit of cash flow coming in. Um, so we can kind of build programs, but it's also manageable from a community standpoint. Right. 
So this slide kind of um, defines what a millage is. Um, so a millage is the tax rate used to calculate property taxes. Um, you'll find here it's defined in you know, a number known as a mill or a percentage um, as we go along. But a millage rate re represents a dollar for every $1,000 of a property's assessed value. Um, so assigned millage rates are applied to the total taxable value of a property in order to arrive at your taxable amount. Um, so these figures here, you'll find these on the budget that was most recently adopted for this year, 21-22. Um, our millage rate is 34.42. Um, and the district's total assessed value is $603 million. Um, so, you know, back out from homestead exclusions, um, and our collection percentage, you kind of see the net generated by mills, but that 34.42, you get about $19 million. Right. And then the next slide um, is more of a bar chart, kind of showing, again, you know, the mindset to simply, you know, stay relatively flat tax, um, but maintain that conservative approach both, you know, for the community as well as the school district. Um, but this, this is shown in terms of a mill, not a percentage. And this one is a comparative to all the other districts in Berks County. Um, so we've defined the revenues, um, but you're kind of going to see what a mill is worth, not only in Brandywine School District, but all the districts. You can see uh, the mill, and there's a star beside it. Um, you can see that our mill is the, the value of, the gross dollar value of one mill is the second lowest in the county, only to Antietam. Um, so basically that's saying, it's kind of showing that our makeup of our assessed value is mostly residential farmland. Um, so our assessed value as a district, there's not a lot of value in our land um, compared to if you go to the other district, say uh, Exeter or let's see, Wilson, um, they generate a lot more per mill. And then kind of, if you see on the right side, and I'll, I'll provide an example later just to explain this because I know mills can be kind of confusing. Um, you'll see one mill say, you know, both Cooks County and us have, you know, our millage rate, our tax rate is 30 mills. Um, so we would only get about 17.9 million versus Cooks County with the same exact millage rate just because of their assessed value of their land within their district more, they would get about $21 million. So this is probably my most interesting slide, and then one I'll show you um, two slides down. Um, and you'll kind of see where it has some errors and whatnot. Um, this slide shows a millage comparison in two periods of time, both in 2010, 2011, and in 2020, 2021. And then you kind of see a trend line going, and it gives the percentage increase. Um, so it's kind of the change, you know, that 10 year span that district kind of underwent. Um, so you would see just that from our assessed value that you, you would think um, our millage would be second highest in the county from a millage standpoint, and we are. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the percentage change, we're kind of somewhere in the middle um, versus Antietam's, you know, all the way on the right or all the way up top, they've had the most significant increase. Um, and then I'll, with the example, it'll kind of make more sense. But before, before I go on to the next slide, I kind of want you to look at Tolba Hopkins, who has seen a millage rate decrease, and then Antietam, who saw the significant increase. Um, some of you are kind of wondering, you know, what, what's Tolba Hopkins doing that they can decrease, you know, their millage rate? Um, and it's, you know, maybe it's something, a little bit of what they're doing, but it also has to do with something that kind of out of their control. And then Antietam, same thing. It's not really what they're doing, it's kind of something that's outside of their control. And it kind of goes with us and our tax increase as well. There's also pieces that you can't control with your military. Right, so I'll come back to that. But I, I kind of want to touch on this one. Um, so like, like I said, there's some things that you cannot control. You can, to generate more revenue, you can obviously, you can increase taxes. But you, would also, you can also experience growth inside your school districts, which would increase the assessed values. So this shows the five-year historical assessed value growth. Um, as you saw, Tulpa Hawken, they were able to, you know, stay flat, um, even decrease their millage rate, because they had, you know, at least double, almost 
um, SSIE growth over the last five years versus everybody else. <coughs> and kind of around 2%, 1%, uh, if you look at us, we're only you know 0.65%. Our district, we don't really see a lot of growth, um, mostly because we're residential farmland. And then uh, Corn and Seedum, they've had to you know, significantly increase taxes because uh, their SSIEs are actually going down. Um, so that's something that we the district, we have to be mindful um, and kind of, you know, when we're planning, budgeting, we have to be conservative and also keep that in mind that we don't really have the growth. So kind of go back to this millage example. All right, so we take family one. They're living in only Valley School District. They have an assessed value of $150,000. Um, they live in a rancher. Uh, the school board has set the real estate tax rate at 27.66 mils. Uh, the homeowner's tax bill, bill would be about $4,100. So you take the 26.6, multiply it by the 150. And we come to Brandywine. Uh, similar situation. We have the district, we want to generate that $4,140, the same as Oli did. We want to have the same tax revenue. Um, so unfortunately, our you know assessed value is not quite as much. So to basically to achieve the same tax revenue on a, a similar household, we would have to tax at a higher rate, which is 34.42, to generate as a group the same amount of tax revenue. But unfortunately, we have to tax to generate the same $4,100 in Brandywine. That that hits a home that only say they're assessed value of only 120,000 versus a wealthier perhaps wealthier family over in Oli. So basically that kind of shows that here at Brandywine we also have to be mindful is we're probably taxing more of a lower, um, cheaper property than uh, say Oli is. Um, we don't have the ability to tax or generate revenue as easily as our neighboring district. All right, so kind of moving on to the expenditure side, kind of cover the revenue side, mostly focus on local revenues. All right, so you're going to see here, this is a pie chart that's coming from the 2021 budget that we just wrapped, well, we just wrapped up the audit. Um, but this is kind of looking at the budget piece, and you kind of see that the two biggest parts are salary and benefits. Um, but then if you also take it a step further, approximately 80% of our budget, well, total expenditures is from, you know, the 100, 200, 300, and 500, which is salary, benefits, purchase services, which includes tuition phase charter schools, and also um, professional and technical services. So those things that we outsource. Um, so basically 80% is, you know, personnel, that's always an interesting chart. Which one did you say had the most charter schools? The uh, 500 tuition. Yeah. All right, so next I'm going to go into mandates. Um, I would say unfunded or underfunded mandates. Um, these are costs that must be paid to a school district, um, basically due to federal or state law, um, but they provide little to no um, funding to actually pay for the cost of the program that they implement. Um, whether, they have, whether it's underfunded or unfunded, they have significant and direct effects on school district funding. When the mandates are introduced or modifications are made with additional requirements, um, a lot of times special ed will change the requirements or, you know, um, kind of enhance them. Um, they don't really give us more money to do so. Um, and as a result, we must then reduce or eliminate program staffing, operational functions, and also increase uh, our revenues, which are our taxes. Um, this often limits the school board's and administrator's ability to shape away portions of the budget because um, obviously those areas that we can't really touch. Um, so you'll see there's prevailing wage. Uh, prevailing wage is something that school districts, we have to pay state mandated wages for work on public sector. Um, construction and renovation projects have C25,000. Um, this kind of goes into the construction project, not so much the general fund day-to-day -day operations. Um, 
and these rates are established by the Department of Labor, and I believe we follow the Philadelphia prevailing wage rates. Um, so that's kind of a significant increase in our cost for any construction project. Um, it's not like we can call the local electrician to come do work for us, um, say for this renovation and whatnot. Now I'll kind of talk about teasers, special ed, and charter schools as we move forward. But as you can see, kind of highlighted over the last 10 years, these major areas represent the largest portion of annual growth um, when it comes to expenditures. Kind of, kind of getting into teasers, but kind of tying it back to uh, our millage rate. Um, we're kind of showing how the millage increased over time, and you can kind of see it by the trend line over here, currently at 34.42. Um, but unfortunately, as you can see, at about the same rate that our millage is increasing, our teasers rate is increasing. Um, so we're kind of struggling to keep up with this issue. It's not something you know specific to Brandywine. This is statewide with all Pennsylvania school districts. Um, so as you can see, between 2010, 11, and today, the mandated employer contribution has increased significantly. Um, so basically, um, for this year, it's 21, 22. Um, for every dollar in salaries, we're paying 34, basically 35 cents to teasers. Um, and when you kind of think about it, and it's not on this chart, if you go back to just 20 years ago, back in 2001, 2002, the teasers contribution rate for the district was only 1.09%. Um, so that's a pretty dramatic increase. Um, and as a result, I mean, that kind of goes back to we have to make cuts where, you know, areas that we can control. All right. <clears throat> the next slide is just showing the trend of teasers again. Um, expenses, but more so from a lump sum. Um, from year to year and not simply just a percentage increase. This is actual numbers uh, for Brandywine School District. Um, you can see, obviously, we had dipped in 18-19, um, but as a whole, you can see the trend line, it was um, they're steadily increasing. Um, they've actually increased, they were 186.7% they were back from just 2012-2013. And then these are special ed instruction costs. Again, another unfunded mandate. We do get a subsidy from the state, but it's, uh, it's very little in comparison to the actual cost. Um, and then for special education, this is obviously an area where we have to provide appropriate educational programs and services to meet the needs of all children, um, regardless of the handicap, disability, um, or the need specific, for specifically designed instruction. Um, this is due to you know, federal, state laws, regulations, court opinions. Um, they, they dictate virtually every aspect of providing education to students with disabilities. Um, it's, it's fair to say, um, you see we spent 4.4 million. Um, special education is one of the most costly mandates imposed on school districts. Um, and then, Oh, and then I just put in here, it's worth noting, um, Pennsylvania law and regulations require school districts to identify and provide specifically designed instruction programs. Uh, charter schools actually are not required to provide gifted services to the same identified students. That's not really interesting. And then next we move on to charter school tuition expenses. Um, as you probably know, Brandywine is required to make tuition payments to charter and cyber schools for each of our resident students enrolled, um, whether it be a brick and mortar or a cyber charter school. Tuition rates are calculated based on our expenditures, not the expenditures of the district. Um, so obviously a cyber charter school, their expenditures and operating costs are far less than what ours are. Um, this results in varying different tuition rates, um, say somebody from Ole Valley could go, or Reading School District could go to the same cyber charter <laughs> school and they would pay a different rate than what we're paying, um, yet for the same service and instruction. Um, and this, you know, we typically tend to lead us to overpay for charter schools, um, and most notably, this tends to happen to special education in cyber charter school areas. Um, if you look last year, uh, it's probably an anomaly due to the pandemic. Uh, there's a the 750,000 
that the 179% of the amount that was just back in 2012, 2013, um, it's certainly more than the allowable actual index increase. Um, and I, while that looks, uh, that's nothing, you know, good, um, it is worth noting um, that this could have been far worse back in 2021. Um, Mrs. Honich and her team had over 250 students in their full-time uh, cyber virtual academy. Um, they had an 87 completion rate, and without that academy, we probably would have spent an additional $3.4 million. Well, I would they calculate the cost for the charge for $70,000? Yeah, so there's, well, for any charge school, um, whether it be cyber or not, we do what's called a PDE 363, and it's basically this Excel, <coughs> sorry, it's this Excel spreadsheet, and it takes all of our expenses and it withholds, you know, a couple different expenses, um, and then it'll it'll put into this formula and it calculates our annual tuition rate. So it, it's literally based off our budget. So in in there is also they they rank students by <laughs> by their severity, so they have a, a three tiered ranking, uh, and so a student that is a uh, that is costly is tier three, and then ones that are maybe just receiving a physical therapy occupational therapy where they could be a tier one, uh, and so that that tiered ranking also then is a contributing factor to how they evaluate the cost for special education, uh, but that. That budget that we build in for special education, which is inclusive of out, out of placement students, uh, is what is used then to drive our faculty. <coughs> I think, if I remember right from the board meeting, we talked about it. I think it's 37000 is what our cost is for that, special education. So that varies from district to district. Based off of their education. So where do we stand and what our costs are? From, I think we saw this recently. We, we did. We, so we talked about the county <laughs> average, and we're higher than the county average for our special education costs. And, and primarily that's because when you look at a small school, small schools always are going to have a higher per pupil mm -hmm. expenditure than a large school. So you can spread your your staff, your, your students out over a larger, so you, you compare us to a, a Wilson or a, a Boyertown or Red is kind of an anomaly, but any of those bigger school districts, we're going to have a much higher per pupil allocation than the others. So you take a Tolpe, you take a Fleetwood, you take an Ole, a Kutztown, we're going to be all in a similar boat for a per pupil expenditure because we're smaller schools. But it drives up the cost. Do you want me to take the next two slides? Sorry, I have to clock. The next one. Um, the next two slides kind of just go over um, some budgeting practices and how you know control costs. Um, kind of just some really relatively flat from year to year. So you can see this one is a six-year curriculum cycle. Um, it's a multi-step process in which all the districts is analyzed and designed um, in a systematic and collaborative manner. Um, it obviously from from their from their lens and allows for you know the evaluation. Um, but also the development process, the implementation, revision, um, and then just time to allow the program uh, to be program effectiveness, effectiveness to be realized. All right, so this, um, so this process has several benefits. First, and from a financial perspective, this model enables effective and fiscally responsible use of district resources. <coughs> Um, so, and then when we're budgeting, we kind of give allocate the same amount from year to year. And then also you can see here is the four-year technology cycle. Um, four years is about the expected useful life of all the um, equipment. Um, so it has several purposes, um, helps the district and the technology department structure budgets and eliminate the need to dispose of outdated or surplus equipment. But it also ensures that teachers, staff, and students also have access to current technology. All right, so once the annual budget approves, um, it doesn't really give the district, you know, kind of that blank check to, you know, spend, spend the entire amount. 
Um, throughout the year, we kind of make a conscious effort to reduce expenditures and realize cost savings. Uh, funds are not simply spent because they've been budgeted, um, they're spent because they're necessary. So at the end of the year, we, we might have, you know, what's called um, money unspent. And that'll, that'll go into what we call it as a fund balance. Um, and that, that kind of reflects our efforts taken as a district to manage our finances in a responsible manner. Um, so you'll kind of see our fund balance over the years. And there's kind of this misconception that money put in the fund, fund balance is kind of this rainy day set aside fund. Um, but it's really not. It's, it's not similar to your um, personal savings or cash account. <coughs> um, and then also kind of the purpose of the fund balance uh, more so for Brandywine um, it's also to you know, maintain adequate financial cash reserves in order to demonstrate a financial position strong financial position um, if we go to you know um, obtain any financing they're going to look at our reserves to see that you know we have adequate resources but it also allows us to have solid financial planning and sound fiscal management um, fund balance should be at a level that supports attaining district long-range goals in the community and for our students. Um, insufficient fund balance could result in district borrowings um, when it's probably not necessary or ideal. Um, so you'll see a lot of, I guess, smaller items or, you know, capital or, I guess, maintenance items we kind of fund within our general fund budget from year to year um, versus some districts that don't have the fund balance on hand, they would have to go out and find. So then kind of getting deeper dive into fund, fund balance, you can kind of see there's kind of four buckets. There's the restricted, the committed, assigned, and unassigned. Um, it's typically best practice for, for school districts to maintain um, an unassigned fund balance between 4 and 8% uh, of all expenditures. Uh, last year, at year end, you can see here, we had 2.5 million, which was approximately 6.6% of uh, unassigned fund balance. Um, so you see at the last board meeting, we did, you know, move some of that money into a fine fund balance to kind of bring us down closer to that 4%. Um, there, so, but there's typically three um, buckets up here that the district kind of um, focuses on. And the first one would be committed fund balance. So see up there, that's where we put our PEASERS, you know, money for um, to kind of help offset that retirement spike, so to say. Um, then there's assigned fund balances that are intended for specific purposes. Um, typically, the board approves those as well. And then the unassigned fund balance. Right. And then here is our long-term debt. These are our mostly our bond issuances. Um, as of June 30th, the district had 16.5 million <coughs> of outstanding debt. Um, on four obligation bonds. Um, this is a decrease of 2.2 million from the prior year. Um, while we're in the midst of a capital improvement initiative, it should be noted that all debt here is to be repaid within about 10 years. You'll see the last payment is in 2031-32. Um, and we are also well within our you know, recommended borrowing limits. Um, whenever you take out money, um, you can see Moody's or S&P, they'll kind of give you a credit rating. Um, it's worth uh, double A negative, I believe. So um, we're well within our capacity. Um, and you can also see some of this debt. Um, in prior years, we had a 2014 and 2015 bond. Um, these have been paid off or they were refinanced and rolled into existing um, bond instances that you'll see here tonight. Um, and kind of there's two reasons for that. One, we put out new money um, for our current renovation projects, the four phases that we're undergoing. But also, uh, interest rates are at basically a historic low. Um, so we were able to refinance and save money on that end. And kind of the thought behind the 10 year window is that by the time these are paid off, um, it'll probably be time to you know, look at the high school and um, kind of fix some areas over there. So, forward looking, um, <coughs> it appears. Um, 2022, 23, um, and ongoing, it's going to be an ongoing cha challenge for the district. Um, obviously, the uncertainty of COVID 19, uh, the increased cost of you know, providing new to good public education, um, funding, and also our economy that we're dealing with. Um, 
we as districts you know, will continue to monitor the health of the local economy, but we'll also keep a, a focus on what's going on in Harrisburg, because um, you'll see a lot of that um, has an impact on you know, our, the funding that they provide us. Um, and also, um, we kind of went over the unfunded or underfunded mandates, um, but, like, but like other costs you're experiencing, you know, personally as well, just when you go out and buy things, a lot of things are increasing, you know, anywhere from 7 to 10% um, in areas that, you know, we need in order to operate. Um, so keep that in mind, and also a combination, you know, flat de declining state and federal funding. Um, again, the development really shifts the burden to the local taxpayer, resulting in an increase in taxes. So, you know, it's up to us, you know, find ways to save money where we can and use our resources to our best of our ability. So some key takeaways, um, just we talked about our assessed values um, being the second lowest. Um, most of our parcels are made up of farmland and residential parcels, and only 3.5 of our parcels are commercial or industrial. Um, total assessed value, uh, again, lowest first county, a little growth historically and for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have second highest millage rate, again, that's kind of due to our assessed value. Um, and then as a result, you know, that kind of forces us to increase taxes at a higher rate to achieve, achieve the same revenue streams as our other Berks County districts. Um, but due to being fiscally responsible and managing our resources, we've been able to maintain a low tax increase over nine years. We haven't had to actually, you know, increase taxes by the full actual and adjusted index for grant funds. Any questions? Yeah, All right, so to um, wrap things up, uh, the facility side of it, we've been talking about uh, the intersect with the uh, bonds and, and the loans that uh, uh, Mr. Lovegrove is talking about. We are going through a four phase uh, construction project. I think most of us are aware of that. But just to recap that, we have a construction committee. The board, the board here knows that. Uh, we have board members that sit as part of that construction committee and work directly with administration as well as uh, in this upcoming phase of the project, uh, the engineering firm through the ESCO project. Uh, we have a multi-year uh, improvement plan, which we've, we've been talking about. That includes the four phases, but it's also long stretching. So it's not just the, the projects that are right in front of us, these big bucket things, but it's an ongoing maintenance of effort uh, that we have a detailed plan for the next five years to make sure that things like parking lots, make sure things like paint, all those things that still have to get done are part of our ongoing process and the budgeting process and long-term plan for the school district. So this is just a recap of, of our school of our school building. So our elementary school was built in 1960. This building was 1955, and then our high school was 2003. Um, we have done uh, renovations to those throughout the years, uh, and then most notably, of course, we are going through a phase project to help improve this. So this is the phase project uh, increases. So. Our first one started back in 2019, so those that were on the board back then, you can remember that at that pain point, we started this whole process and sat in a community meeting and talked about uh, our long-term vision for where we were headed with building projects. So we had to, if we were at the point where our facilities were not falling apart, but we needed to make a conscious effort to spend some dollars, knowing that our, our current debt process was falling off, to revitalize our knowing that the years of them, knowing that the last time we did a construction project was 20 plus years ago. And so um, we engaged in a, two, uh, a four phase project phase. One was to summer 2019, we had to replace our high school roof, unfortunately. Uh, it was poorly designed from the beginning. And so we have a brand new roof on that uh, high school and that is uh, in a much better shape. Uh, the elementary office also received an upgrade. Uh, it was in a very uh, positioning of the district, but not a office is not a secure area where you had to walk down the office, walk down the hallway to get to the office. Uh, and so we created a whole new uh, secure entrance area with bulletproof glass, um, but an inviting area as well. And so that was the uh, phase one project when we received a $587,000 grant to do that. Phase two then started a much broader project enhancement of our elementary school. And we did an expansion adding a new library uh, re relocate the library, put in two new classrooms in that old library space, making a new beautiful library, making a new gymnasium, uh, four new classrooms, and a STEM room that was all part of that uh, investment in the elementary school. 
Uh, right now, we're going through phase three, which is uh, the ISMS, the Intermediate School Middle School renovation. This space right here that we're sitting in is part of that. Uh, as you can see, it's a much more uh, updated space. The, the whole stage front here, the sound, sound panels, the new seats, all of that is part of this. The new common areas, new paint on the wall, new flooring, uh, new learning spaces, and the whole brand new STEM room. So you can see this common theme of STEM room and investing in science technology as part of our own building uh, theme here as our building project. So we can take existing space and reallocate it to the new learning potential for our students. Uh, and then finally, phase four, which we're going to be uh, we're, we're beginning that process of planning right now. We'll be to do some work outside here at the Intermediate Middle School, to do some work outside of the high school with, with the stadium staging. Uh, and then a majority of this project is to do a lot of the HVAC upgrades in this building, HVAC upgrades at the high school, uh, and then auditorium lighting at the high school. So just some quick pictures to show the changes. This was our old entrance. Uh, and now this is our new beautiful entrance that we walk into. Uh, and this is that lobby area that we were talking about, which is a, a welcoming area. Nice, bright, clear, but also very secure. Um, this is our new learning spaces. So this is the, the library and STEM space. And again, just a remarkable space, one of our nicest in the, in the entire district. And then a beautiful brand new uh, gymnasium at the elementary school, which has a twofold purpose, one be uh, gymnasium and kind of their auditorium area for events. Uh, it also is the space that we can use to cross-reference and hold uh, other sports events, uh, practices, youth practices, uh, overflow for middle school sports to use that space. Some updated pictures of what we've done here in this building. So that a new entrance area, this building we're sitting in, the space we're looking in now. Uh, a brand new STEM space. We took the old uh, boardroom meeting space at LGI, converted it into this beautiful STEM lab area. Uh, and then finally, uh, the common areas, the hallways, the, the old hexagon centers have been blown out. And now there's all these beautiful common learning spaces, which is really being utilized uh, on a daily basis by our students and staff. So this is the final phase. I'm not going to go through all this, but it's mentioned what I mentioned earlier. It's the HVAC <laughs> upgrades. It's the out upgrades to the outside of this building, the stadium. Not a whole re, uh, a brand new stadium, but a, a rehab to make sure that we're meeting codes. Uh, and then some work over at the high school to make a more secure area for dropping off uh, students into that building. Uh, and again, all those HVAC pieces that we need to, uh, HVAC is just really costly. So to try to pull that into a regular budget, it's, it's pretty intense to do that, so that's why we're trying to roll that into this project. We're doing it through a visa, which is energy savings. Uh, you ever see the Energy Savings Act? And so the, the concept behind this is that you partner with the company, uh, and there's no change orders involved. So you, you develop the scope, you partner with that company, and then they roll out the project, and there's no change orders associated. So you, you have to really define that scope, but you are working together instead of a in some ways, uh, a process where you have a contractor, you're the owner, and maybe we won't see eye to eye. This is truly a partnership process. You have a funding strategy to, to do that. We do bank, uh, bonds, bank loans, uh, account reserve accounts, uh, and grants. So we, I talked about grants, but we were very lucky to be able to have grants to do the elementary edition. We also have grants coming in through COVID funds, through the ESSER funds. And we're able to offset a lot of that HVAC cost in this upcoming phase of the project. Great. Uh, and then we talked about the, uh, the bank loans and the bonds. We talked about the debt earlier. And then the final bucket is this capital reserve account, which is part of that fund, bond, fund balance strategy where you put dollars aside in fund balance, your savings account of the school district, to uh, offset some of these ongoing costs. And, and that's associated with the building project, but that's also associated with that multi tier, multi year uh, plan for renovations of, of our facility. Some key takeaways here, the board recognized that, that need to make, make improvements in our facilities and, and we embarked on that starting back in 2019, a four phase project which we talked about and then the funding of the project maintains the existing stack uh, taxing structure uh, with the debt expiring uh, in 10 years. Any questions on the facilities? Any questions in general? So what I hope you were able to take away from tonight, and I know it was long, and I apologize, uh, but what I hope you were able to take away tonight 
is some of those cross connects. So we talk about demographics, we talk about the poverty piece, how that's connected over to the academic piece, and how that is then connected over to some of the changes in what's happening with our assessed value, uh, and what that ultimately means to then the taxation piece of the revenue coming to the school district. All these things are interconnected, uh, and, we, and it's hard when we talk about what's happening with this piece of it, or what's happening with the academic side, or what's happening with our demographic shift. All these pieces are interconnected, whether it's the financial planning for the school district, uh, how we have to support our students, or it's the revenue coming in from the taxation, or it's how we're going to support the academic program. The goal tonight was to, while well, we presented it in buckets and, and in somewhat of isolation, that you start to see that all these things work in concert with each other as we make planning decisions for the school district in terms of financial sustainability or uh, in terms of the academic program for our students. So thank you so much for coming this evening. Oh, yes. Just a question in terms of revenue and um, real estate taxes um, for or specifically transfer tax revenue. Um, real estate market has been booming the past 18 or 24 months. Um, and continues to be. Have we um, recognized any benefit from that in terms of revenue coming into the district? I know a lot of other school districts have. Do, do you know what our? Do you know what that? The answer to that is. Yeah, so I don't have. I don't have the exact numbers offhand, um, but I think last year um, we, we far exceeded what we had budgeted, um, and I think it was probably the highest amount that I didn't look back all the way historically, but that we had received as a district. Um, and that, that certainly that continues. Uh, that's a continuing trend this year as well. Um, the other interesting, interesting trend is we were concerned about people pay, being able to pay their taxes last year because of COVID, and it was the highest collection we've ever had in, in history, which is interesting. So those are two good news campers. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, thank you everyone for coming this evening. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I know it's a lengthy meeting, but I appreciate you hanging in there with us. And again, hopefully it was beneficial. So, nice job, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.